welcome back to Emotions and Potions, a love slash hate letter to you. I'm Ashton. And I'm Alex. And welcome back to another week where we are taking you on the journey of a rock star romance. And not just any rock star romance. A reverse harem rock star romance. And if you're not familiar, reverse harem is when there is one girl and she has multiple love interests. This episode, we're going to be talking about Lilac by B.B. Reed. So, you've already been kind of warned. If this is a book that is kind of outside of your wheelhouse, something you're not really into, there's going to be a lot of that. So, And there's more of that, which I feel like brings us into the trigger and content warnings for this book. <laughs> yeah, so before we go any farther, you know that we like to kind of give y'all a heads up on what we will be discussing. So here are some trigger slash content warnings that Alex has kind of come up with throughout reading this book. We have graphic sexual content, including swords play and MM scene, toxic relationships, sexism, misogyny, adult minor relationship, child marriage, religious bigotry, emotional abuse, substance use slash abuse, death slash suicide, gun violence, Blood, injury, slash injury detail, infidelity. And some tropes that you might find include enemies to lovers, reverse harem, bully romance, forced proximity, group sex, public sex, voyeurism. I mean, there's probably a few others, but you know, let's not ruin everything just yet. I mean, we will ruin this book. So as we always say, if this is not something that you want to listen to... Now you are warned. If you are still with us, we're happy because this is going to be a journey. And welcome to the Smut Club. (laughs) So Alex, can you give us this synopsis? I, Braxton Fawn, am the luckiest girl alive, or the world keeps telling me. Every so often, gods walk the earth. This time, they come as musicians. When Bound loses its lead guitarist, yours truly is chosen to fill his shoes. From dive bars to the big stage... My instant claim to fame is nothing short of a fairy tale. The only problem? My new bandmates. Jaded, gorgeous, and ridiculously talented, they're determined to turn my dream into a nightmare. It's no secret I wasn't their first choice. I wasn't even their last. The label wants a new image. Bound wants me gone. But I've got my own agenda. To succeed, I have to thrive a world tour, public scrutiny, and idols turned enemies. But the biggest threat of all isn't a malicious frontman, a narcissistic bassist, and a drummer with too many secrets. It's me. Somehow, I must resist the temptation of Houston Morrow, Lauren James, and Jericho Noble. It seemed easy enough when I boarded their tour bus, but it only took one city for the lines we drawn to blur. Only 99 more to go. Lilac is a reverse harem and a standalone suitable for ages 18 plus. I thought that was actually pretty good. It was. For not giving too much away, but... There's only one sentence I have an issue with. Which one? Which is, every so often, gods walk the earth. I was almost wondering if this was going to be, like, a Greek mythology, <laughs> like, retelling with, like, Apollo or, like, okay, some shit. Okay, I feel shit. that. I feel that. But then the rest of it's like, okay, no, it's not. It's, it's just a phrase, Alex. I know. Don't, but, don't dig too deep. But you know I like my Greek myth retellings. I know. This is not one of those. No, it's not. (laughs) It's just a rock star reverse harem. And then something that we thought is important to kind of give you guys an insight on, because it's kind of hard in the plot summary to mention all of the really, really like more intense. Intricate details about each person. But there's one thing with Braxton that really stands out and needs to be noted. And it's that she has synesthesia, which is where she can like, taste and smell words and in this book in particular emotions so like her emotions manifest through her like smelling them so alex for this week's potion what have you made me it looks delicious so this week is actually a mocktail because really yeah because um in the book the band bound they're sober oh yeah See, this is why Alex is in charge of the potions, because she just, she gets it. Okay, so what what (laughs) mocktail, what mocktail did you make? I'm intrigued. So I've dubbed this Bound to You. Love that. 
It's a mocktail of a mojito. And I made it with green tea, lemonade, some mint simple syrup, some club soda, and some fresh mint. Yum. And the mint is a pineapple mint. This sounds like a perfect summer drink. Okay, let's try this. Cheers. Cheers. That is so flippin' good. Don't even miss the alcohol. No, I'm, I'm actually glad this is non-alcoholic. Um, this potion can be found on our Instagram, Emotions and Potions Pod. It can be found on our TikTok, same handle. And the recipe will also be in the episode description. I think it's time that we just dive in, huh? Let's get into this. So we start off the book with a press release stating that the lead guitarist Calvin of Bound has been found dead of an overdose at 27 years old. Braxton is on her way to Savant Records when she's thinking about the most recent news of Bound's late guitarist. She is running late for a meeting and finally shows up and is brought to a room housing the surviving members of Bound, who are Houston, Jericho, and Lauren. It's obvious that Braxton has no idea why she has been summoned to this meeting and has just kind of been thrown into the deep end. We learn that Braxton is wearing what they call a like burlap sack of an outfit and rubs the members of Bound the wrong way. Also, not only because she comes looking kind of not put together, she is interrupting their really important meeting. Great first impression. They also don't know what's going on. They have no idea who this girl is. We do learn that Braxton has been scouted to be the replacement of Calvin on lead and rhythmic guitar, and none of the band members are happy about this. Probably because they're all attracted to her. (laughs) Instant attraction and instant hate. There's a lot of tension and good banter between the bandmates and Braxton in this late chapter, and Houston really wants them to find anyone else to replace Calvin, but Carl, the head of the label, is not budging. Braxton is summoned by Oni, who is the record label's recruiter, for a meeting later that evening. We meet Braxton's bestie and roommate, Griffin. I love Griffin. (laughs) Yeah, Griffin is... She's a fun character. I like Griffin and then the other roommate we're going to meet. They're just, uh, love them. Fantastic. Braxton goes to the bar to meet Oni, and we learn that she also discovered Bound. Oni wants Braxton to try to fix and keep the band together during this tour because she knows that they're really only one fight away from a breakup. And she's pretty much, by any means necessary, keep these boys together. Two weeks have gone by and Braxton has not heard from the band or their manager, Xavier, but Braxton is getting ready for a gig that she has with her current band, which she's playing at a festival in the desert. So it's like a Coachella, but like probably like indie. All of a sudden, a helicopter starts to land right in the festival grounds and it's none other than Bound. And like Bound is like a world like renowned and known. They're like stadium tour artists. Mm. They are selling out stadiums. So they're huge. And Braxton is playing at this little indie festival. <laughs> and in walks, you know, well, in flies, <laughs> it, like the end all be all to like rock music. Yep. Braxton did invite Oni to the show, but she did not invite Bound. But Oni did not show. Sneaky. Snick a little snake. <laughs> And obviously the band members are calling her out about the fact that she didn't invite them. Well, they weren't nice to her. I know, they were Why would you get the invite? (laughs) Once again, we get some, like, really intense, flirty, aggressive enemies type of banter, like, right before she's going on to perform. Now Braxton has to also go on stage in front of a pretty decent-sized crowd that is low-key expecting Bound to play. So it's pretty much a tough crowd now. Like, she's walking out. To potentially a, who the fuck are you? Give us bound. Yeah. So not looking good for Braxton right now. So she takes the stage anyway and pretty much blows everyone away, including her new bandmates, by her performance. She slays. So both Griffin and Miko, who is their other roommate, fangirl over the fact that Braxton knows the band. Of course they are. Braxton then gets a DM from Lauren telling her she had a great show and then asking what color her panties she is that she's wearing. (laughs) 
Just get ready for more of this behavior from Lauren. So, like, this sums up who Lauren is to a T. <laughs> Ridiculous. But I kind of love him. Yeah. And, like, Lauren is, like, the pretty boy of the band. He's, like, blonde, always well put together. Came from a very, like, wealthy family. Is always taking, like, hour-long showers. Like, is just very thorough. Definitely the prima donna of the group. I mean, they're all kind of prima donnas, but, like... He takes the... He's he, the cherry on the top. Yeah. Like, yeah. And Braxton then, like blocks him on Instagram because he slides into a DMs, which I just like loved that too. I just was like, so Braxton finally gets an invite from Bound to come to a rehearsal. So she makes her way to their Beverly Hills mansion. Her car has broken down. So she has to take the bus and then walk a mile carrying her guitar at like six in the morning. In heels. In heels. Like, cause she rocks it like she's always wearing platform like combat boot-esque type of things on her feet always looking very edgy rocky with her like flaming red hair yeah like her style gets described as being like a mixture of like rock boho and emo and emo so that's kind of her vibe so she shows up two minutes late and houston is already on her ass about it and just being a dick he's such a dick so Houston is their lead, is the lead man, and he's depicted as being, like, the biggest of the three. Muscular. Brown hair, green, green eyes. Green eyes. Handsome. Like, but, like, rough. Like, tough looking. Intense. Yes. And he's a dick. So we also get a lot of enemies type banter here, which is also, like, undertoned with, like, tension of sexual nature. Yeah, because also Houston's very controlling. He's, like wants to control everything the band does and everything everybody else does. Yeah, yeah. And so all three of them kind of corner her in their house as, and Lauren calls it a little playful hazing that they're initiating on her. (laughs) Okay. Braxton makes her exit to the bathroom where she ultimately ends up touching herself to release the pent-up tension that she's feeling from her bandmates after that encounter. So, yeah, she's definitely attracted to all of them, and there's a lot of... I mean, I can't blame her for getting a little flustered for, like, these three, like, gorgeous rock star men, like, kind of, like, circling around her and... I know. Having these, like, sexy, worded standoffs. I know! <laughs> So we've learned up to this point that all three of her bandmates find Braxton very attractive and Rich even likes her as like a person. Rich is probably the nicest band member up front. Like he is more welcoming right Mm -hmm. off the bat than the other two. And Lauren calls him out on that and is like, stop being such a pussy. Like, I need you to be mean to her. Rich then ultimately goes to check on check on Braxton because she's been in the bathroom for quite a bit now. And he offers her some advice. He tells her that she needs to make the rest of the band respect her or else things won't get better for her. And then they also have some like flirty banter here as well. Braxton makes her way down to the band practice where Houston is just coming at her hard once again and giving her a hard time about her skill level, just like, Nothing she does will be right. He just keeps berating her. As they are practicing, Braxton decides to add some flair into her chords in one verse. And Houston obviously calls her out on changing their song. Like, that's just... She even thought that it wasn't going to be noticeable, but no. Houston knew. After rehearsal, Braxton asks the guys if they could assist her in helping with her transportation since her car is broken down. And they agree that someone will come pick her up every morning. And she also tags on that they have to get her coffee in the morning as well. She leaves the house and she gets three DMs. One from Lauren saying he's so turned on right now. <laughs> Classic Lauren. Yeah, because didn't he – he finds her phone and unblocks himself. Yes. Yeah, he does. He like – and gets into her phone, breaks into her past. Yeah. Such – so Lauren. Oh, my God. She also gets one from Rich, which is just like a smiley face. And then the last one is from Houston telling her a car will collect her at 6 a.m. and to not be late. The next morning, her driver picks her up and takes her through the drive-thru to get some coffee as they make her way to band practice. So the guys obviously told their driver to also stop and get Which, 
Okay. <laughs> kind of sweet. Yeah. Like the one nice gesture that's been done so far from them. Houston is still not impressed with Braxton with Braxton's skills and is on her to play better. Still going on. Obviously, throughout this band practice and conversation with Houston, there's a lot of tension, low-key flirting, but also some, like, bully-like dialogue. Because this is kind of a bully romance. Mm -hmm. So you definitely get that happening here. After Braxton leaves, the three bandmates are in the kitchen where both Lauren and Rich are telling Houston that he needs to stop being such an asshole and that he just has an issue with her in general. And it's not her playing. Lauren also calls dibs on Braxton. And none of the other bandmates are that pleased with that statement. They're kind of like, mm, that, no, you can't call dibs on a person. And Lauren's like, that's what dibs are. You can dibs anything. Like, <laughs> child. <laughs> only child syndrome. <laughs> yeah, Lauren has only child syndrome so bad. Yeah. Yes. And so after this statement, the boys decide to get dinner at the restaurant that Brax works at. So Rich barges into Lauren's room to grab him, and we start to see some of the cracks of their friendship slash foundation. Rich ultimately came into Lauren's room to get him help tie his tie since they're going to a fancy restaurant to see Braxton. That requires a tie. That requires a tie. So they arrive at the restaurant, and they ask for Braxton to be their waiter. But she's actually just the hostess, but since they're bound, the manager makes an exception. Braxton is not thrilled to see them and kind of makes a scene and gets yelled at by her boss. Like, he tries to fire her. He threatens to fire her. And the band's like, no. We know her. Yeah, like, it's It's fine. (laughs) And she has to end up being their waitress. So she waits on them the entire night. Obviously, throughout this dinner scene, we get some witty banter. Lots of attitude. As well as the guys giving her hell because she's low-key being rude to them but she just doesn't care. At the end of the dinner, Braxton comes back looking a little flustered, a little ruffled, and Lauren can tell that she is no longer wearing underwear under her dress. So after Braxton's shift, she gets a text saying, I know your secret from a number that she doesn't have. She asks who it is, and their response is, the reason you're not wearing panties. (laughs) Fucking Lauren, man. So... They end up FaceTiming, and it's Lauren. (laughs) Braxton is at a bus stop late at night going home from work, and Lauren's not thrilled about that aspect. And he says that their driver could have easily given her a drive home. But so Lauren doesn't let her hang up with him since she's out super late in a sketchy area. Which I thought was really sweet. It is sweet. Lauren does then tell Braxton that Houston will ultimately make her quit her job and he hopes that she's prepared for that conversation, which Braxton does not want to hear. The next morning, Braxton shows up to the house for band, for band practice where Lauren is making breakfast and Braxton confronts Houston about her current hosting job. She argues that she still needs her job because she has to be able to p- afford her shit before tour starts, which is still three months away. That's when Houston slides over a manila folder that has, like, a bunch of tax information. Essentially, they're going to start paying her for her time at practice so that she can quit her hosting job. And it is not little money by any means. But Braxton doesn't give in because she's, like, hard-headed. And she says that she'll quit her job and devote herself to the band when the three of them show her some respect. And then she leaves the kitchen and is ready for practice. So Braxton and the boys have their first band photo shoot and interview, which goes very well. And the guys are on record praising Braxton as a musician. A month after the interview, Braxton returns home to break the news to her parents that she's going on tour with Bound. This did not go over well. (laughs) When she returns to L.A. for rehearsal and Houston is on her shit already, she's not in a great mood because of what went down with her parents, and Braxton snaps back. And Braxton's parents are very conservative. They come from, like, a small town, and, like, the whole town is very conservative. It it gives me, like, Footloose vibes. Yeah. Yeah, where they, like, ban music. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Yes. Yes. When Braxton snaps back, this causes Houston to basically threaten to kill Braxton 
if she doesn't fall in line and then he dismisses her for the day. I thought this was so unnecessary. I was like, really, Houston, you're threatening to murder her? (laughs) It was a bit much. (laughs) It's like, excuse me. (laughs) But of course, the altercation gets Braxton hot and bothered. So she decides to go home to take care of herself. I mean, I probably would, too, if it was Houston. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's time for the first show with Bound. Griff and Mako are there to support Braxton, which we love to see. Yes. Love their friendship. When it's time to go on stage, the boys see her and are taken aback by how hot she looks. Braxton is starting to get nervous, and Houston winds up giving her a pep talk, followed by Lauren, with encouragement from Xavier their manager to do so Houston admits to himself at this point like internally that he wants to fuck Braxton I think he's wanted to do that since the first moment he actually saw her but he's just now finally letting himself go there yeah the show was a success and the boys were in a trance by Braxton on stage so much that as soon as they got backstage Lauren proposes to her such a Lauren move Three days later, it's time to start hitting the road for the tour, and Braxton is sharing a bus with the guys. Hello, forced proximity. But Houston has laid down the law that since Braxton is now one of them, she is officially off-limits sexually. And what Houston says goes. Lauren does not take this well. No, because Lauren has also kind of been fighting... Like, he doesn't want to follow Houston's lead. No. He's also kind of like Alpha. He doesn't want to... Yeah, so, like, Lauren and Houston have been butting heads for a long time at this point, and now it's starting to really hit its peak. Yeah. Yeah. Later, Lauren gets a phone call from his father, who he hasn't spoken to in six years, informing him if he quits Bound and returns home, he can take over his company, and he has three months to decide. Ah, his dad's the worst. And this is, like... A multi-million, potentially billion-dollar company. Like, Lauren comes from some money. money. Braxton passes by when that phone call ends, and Lauren winds up tricking Braxton to go on a date with him under the guise that he's going to show her Vegas. (laughs) She should have known better. She should (laughs) have. The tour, which is really a date, (laughs) winds up being Lauren taking Braxton to a mansion known as The Palace, where he plays uh, poker with a quarter million dollar buy-in. Because also, like, Bound makes buku bucks. Oh, yeah. They're very wealthy. Lauren tries to get Brax to play a hand for him, but she's too nervous with so much money on the line. So he tries to make a bet with her that he'll play the hand, but if he wins, he gets to make her come. (laughs) Some more teasing banter happens with them, which turns both of them on. Braxton finally hints to Lauren that she enjoys sex too much, that men normally can't keep up with her. And this just gets him all excited. (laughs) He's like, I'm up for the challenge. He's like, oh, I got you. (laughs) And she winds up turning him down. Insta boner kill. So this instantly ends their date. (laughs) Jericho was very jealous about Braxton and Lauren's night out. Yeah, he was a little, a little jelly. He kind of had, like, a little tiff with Lauren about it. So the next day, they have another show. Because, you know, they're on tour at this point. And after the show, Braxton is back on the bus. She's going to take a shower. And when she leaves the bathroom, she finds a drunken Lauren in the bedroom fucking a groupie. I was like, are you kidding me, Lauren? Like, only child syndrome. He couldn't get what he wanted, so he found it elsewhere. And then he has to do it in the most, like obvious way of getting back at Braxton. Yep. Ugh. A jealous Braxton stomps off to her bunk and she winds up passing out. She gets woken up later that evening by Rich coming in and yelling at Lauren for being drunk. And this is where we find out the boys have given up all substances and are supposed to be sober. The next morning, Braxton decides that she needs another shower. (laughs) Don't know why, but she she did. (laughs) When she's done, Lauren enters the bathroom, at first ignoring the fact that Braxton is even in there. And when he finally says good morning to her, it's like nothing happened. They get into an argument, 
and Lauren's trying to make up for his actions that he doesn't remember. Blackout. (laughs) Ending with him telling Braxton, you're too good for me. Consider last night me making sure you knew it. Uh, Such a baby. He is. You can't even like just own up to his mistakes. But very on brand. The tour heads to Phoenix. Houston feels control slipping from him. So he decides himself, he doesn't get any input from anybody else, just his way or the highway, that he's going to have Braxton put on another bus all alone. Oh, I hated this. I felt so bad for Braxton. So while Houston is off plotting this, Rich winds up asking Braxton to go to the Musical Instrument Museum. As they're making plans, Houston picks a fight with Braxton, of course, which gets super heated and he winds up like sending Rich away. While it's just Houston and Braxton like going in on each other when things get to like a pinnacle of the argument, he says to her, last chance, Bambi, look down or bow down. Show me who's in charge. (laughs) Oh my God, I can't. Braxton responds to this by smiling and then Houston kisses her. Of course he does. Because he takes it as a challenge. Right. And neither one of them are backing down because that's not what they do. This kiss turns into a steamy makeout scene. When Braxton starts thinking about her past, she starts getting the smell of olives, which means shame, and she breaks the kiss. This pisses Houston off, and he tells her to get back here. And Braxton breaks down and admits she's a sex addict. And as like she finally like screams this, I'm a sex addict, Rich and Lauren also enter the scene. In time to hear this confession. I mean, of course they would, right? So yeah, Braxton, the sex addict. And doesn't she say, like, you you changed one addict to another? Yeah, you you traded one addict for another. Yep. So the museum trip never happened. They're probably like, oh, sweet. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) these three rock stars who are used to, like, banging groupies every night just found out their new guitarist is a sex addict and they all want her. So they're just like... What? <laughs> they probably don't know how to how to deal. <clears throat> After that evening show, Braxton goes back to the bus to find all of her things are packed up outside, and she finds out she's getting her own bus. Lauren and Rich are not happy about this new arrangement. One, they weren't consulted about it. Two, and, yeah, they just lost their sex addict um, <laughs> roommate roommate <laughs> that they both want to bone. So Lauren decides um, that him and Braxton are going to have a pizza party. And he's texting Braxton to, like, get her pizza order. And I thought this was really cute because you see the text messages in the book. And Lauren has Braxton saved in his phone as future girlfriend. I love that. Like, I low-key, like, Lauren annoys me because he's so, like... He's so extra. He's so extra. But, like, I actually thought that was really cute. But a lot of it is really cute. Yeah. It, like, comes from a good place. It's just, like, so much... It's very intense. When he goes to deliver the pizza to Braxton, she won't answer the door for him. So he goes off to steal the spare key to her bus. And when he goes to let himself in, he first notices that his and Braxton's pizza boxes are gone. And when he enters the bus, he spots Rich is already in there with her with the pizza. (laughs) Yes, Rich. (laughs) And also, we never really gave descriptors of Rich. He's, like, the sad emo friend. Like, he has dark hair. He has, like, silver silver eyes. eyes. I don't know what the fuck that means. I don't know. Silver eyes, but okay. And then, um, yeah, he's just, like, he's more of the emo, sad boy. Just to give you a little bit more insight on Rich. (laughs) So the three of them wind up watching Wonder Woman and have a I Hate Houston party. Braxton falls asleep during the movie, and Lauren lets a bomb drop that Rich is married. Dun, dun, dun. But thankfully, you know, she didn't hear this. Because she was asleep. Mm -hmm. The next morning, Braxton wakes up alone in her bed, but she does have a hazy memory of being put to bed with a forehead kiss. Mm. Rich did that. Mm. So cute. And when she wakes up, she's smelling French toast. She finds Lauren... (laughs) In her bus kitchen making her breakfast. They have a banter argument about his nickname for her of Baby Fawn, which leads to Lauren kissing Braxton. And also, Braxton's last name is Fawn. So, like, Bambi, 
baby, baby fawn. fawn. Like that's why they're they're coming up with these nicknames. Their kiss leads to a conversation about Braxton being a nympho and how Lauren has the potential to be falling for her. And how he wants her to let him in and he can handle her demons since he has his own and can run circles around hers. I mean, you know, one thing you can't shit on Lauren for is he he is very, and he's very upfront with how he's feeling. Yeah. And he tries so hard. He does try, but it sometimes backfires. Yeah. But like he is, he's the most upfront with how he's feeling. Mm -hmm. For sure. Next stop on the tour is Denver. When they get there, Rich and Lauren head with the crew to the store, leaving Houston and Braxton alone together, kind of like where all the buses and stuff are parked. So, of course, they get into a heated exchange board, per usual. Per usual. And he winds up pouring his energy drink down her tank top, and then he kisses her. Have you ever heard of the uh, stereotype of, like, a guy picks on a girl when he has a crush on her. It's exactly what Lauren <laughs> winds up saying later. Oh, does he? Yeah. I forgot about that. Whoops. <laughs> but yeah, this is like, that is Houston's MO. Like, he's mean to the girls he likes. Mm-hmm. Braxton winds up punching him in the lip. And when she goes to hit him again, he catches her wrist, not letting her go. And once again, kisses her. This time, he lifts her up and rips off her panties and starts fingering her. Right up on the bus. Yep. There we go. He tells Braxton to get the condom out of his pocket, and when she starts to argue with him about it, he informs her, you're getting fucked with or without it. Your choice. Such a dick. (laughs) So she opts for the condom. Good girl. Good girl. (laughs) Braxton starts getting fucked out in the open where anybody could just, you know, walk up on them at any moment. Houston informs Braxton this isn't personal, it's just business. Which I felt was very contradictory, because also while fucking her, he starts saying, you've never had it this good. Right! I know. Like, Like, he's obviously very, very into it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) As they hear footsteps approaching, he commands her to come on his dick right now. (laughs) And So bossy. So bossy, but this time she does obey. The one time she's obeying. They both are able to finish moments before getting caught. And he leaves her with parting words of, if you find yourself with an itch you can't control, I'm the one who scratches it. The only one. That pussy's mine now. Okay, so Rich can tell that Braxton and Houston have done something sexual when he comes across them outside of the buses. He slyly lets Houston know that he disapproves of the situation. I'm pretty sure um, he's like, his shirt is like coming out of the zippers of his jeans Braxton sporting a new hickey on her neck. I mean, like, they literally just finished, like, fucking, what, probably, like, 0. Seconds. 0.5 seconds before they walked up. Clearly, they're going to have a just-fucked look to them. Yeah. And Rich is thinking that Braxton is every bit a tease that Lauren accuses her of being. He's also pissed at Houston because Houston has been saying that Braxton is off limits, and as soon as they turn their backs, he fucks her. So he's pissed. Not only did he fuck her, now he's laying claim. Yeah, yeah. He pretty much is like, you're mine now, bitch. Braxton tries to talk to Rich and he pretty much shuts her down, saying that whatever she's about to say became meaningless the moment she spread her legs for Houston. A little hypocritical because, you know, he's married. Yeah. And also this like triggers some of like past trauma on Braxton. Rich also ultimately makes Braxton cry. Like that's how mean he's kind of being because he's the nice one yeah and this is something that's like so out of character for him that it's really taking her by surprise but i will say braxton did hurt rich's feelings because he was really starting to feel her and like kind of fall for her and they had an actual friendship at this point so braxton's crying and she goes off and then houston also has to tell lauren that he fucks braxton And you know that Lauren's not going to take that lightly either. The band knows that Houston low-key fucked Braxton in order to get his bandmates head out of the gutter because Houston knows that they won't go anywhere near her now that she's been touched by him. But Lauren doesn't want to take orders from him anymore. And Houston then tells Lauren that he can run back to his daddy and all that money if he really wants to and not listen to his orders. Lauren then runs off... (laughs) (laughs) 
way to follow orders. <laughs> Rich hopes that Houston knows what he's doing, and Rich doesn't think that Braxton deserves what Houston did to her. It took them 16 hours to find Lauren after him and Houston got into the argument, and he was found in a rundown motel, passed out, the floor was littered with empty bottles and condom wrapper, wrappers and discarded clothes. So he obviously is not taking this well. He's spiraling because he's also drinking and they're sober. So mm -hmm. this is a big deal. Houston, Rich, and Lauren kind of get into an argument trying to get Lauren to come back with them. But they finally, they finally get him. Braxton is waiting outside the buses as the boys show up and her focus is solely on Lauren. Braxton apologizes and Lauren is a dick and hints about Houston's alternative motives. Braxton confronts Houston, and he doesn't deny it that he pretty much fucked her so the other two wouldn't want to. She tells him to leave her alone, and he just ends up kissing her. He's such a dick. <laughs> Which Braxton also doesn't appreciate. Rich steps in and carries Braxton away from the situation onto the bus. He's taking the situation hard, and Braxton can tell, and she says that he can still hate her just as long as he stays. She just doesn't want to be alone. He says that she's Houston's now, and it's hard to look at her knowing that. Then she says that she could be his too. Planting the seeds. Planting the seeds. She then leans in and kisses Jericho. Like, they're in this, like, heavy makeout session, and then Braxton drops to her knees and gives Rich a really good blowjob. What's not to enjoy? Especially for him. Right. Rich then takes things in his own hands and is, like, aggressively fucking her mouth. And she swallows everything that he gives her, all that good stuff. He then asks if she's all right and if he hurt her, which I thought was really sweet. Because, like, that is kind of Rich's, like, he's, like, the sweet guy. Until he starts to get naked. <laughs> but, like, Braxton says that it was great. She loved everything that he oh, gave her. Oh, she loves it. But, like, Jericho is definitely the roughest sexual partner. Yeah. Definitely. And he's also the biggest sexual. So maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> he got the biggest dick in the band. They then have a conversation about her sex addiction. And Rich asks if he can return the favor. He ultimately asks her, would she prefer him to go down on her from the front or behind? And like something that I appreciate about like, appreciate about Rich is that, like, he is, like, a very sweet guy and, like, won't do anything. But then when, like, it's – when he wants something or, like, when he's pushed, he kind of then – Snaps. Snaps. And it's kind of like, oh, okay. I like, didn't you know you had both? this in you. Like, like, you can do both? Like, oh. You can give me the aggression when I want it and then you can also be super sweet and, like, and ask nice. me what I want. <laughs> yes. And, like, take me to museums and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, besides for him being married, he's great. <laughs> so Braxton tells Rich that she wants him to go down on her from behind, and we get a really good smutty scene. So the band has finished up their show in Denver, and they are told that the record label has begun to sell backstage meet-and-greet passes since Braxton's popularity has started to increase and people want to meet her. Obviously, the rest of the band has issues with this, specifically Houston. He has issues with everything. Mm. Ultimately, unfortunately for them, I guess, the band ends up having to do the meet and greet. But as soon as they get backstage and they kind of see, like, the setup and people, Houston decides that she's not doing it after all and tells her to go back to the buses. Braxton and Rich ultimately ignore him and head to the meet and greet anyways. After the meet and greet, Houston does tell Braxton that she does a good job because they got through it with no hiccups, which I thought was very big of him <laughs> to say good job. It was probably the first compliment he's ever given her. Great. Besides maybe having a good pussy. <laughs> <laughs> so good for you, Houston. Obviously, Houston and Braxton go at it because Houston's like that. Even right after giving her a compliment, they're right back at each other's throats. Houston then asks Rich, if something happened between him and Braxton, Rich ultimately gives in because Houston is going to confront Braxton about it. And Rich tells Houston that they fooled around, but they didn't have sex. We learn that Houston did fuck Braxton, knowing that Lauren was too proud and Rich was too cautious to do anything after that. 
but it somehow has backfired because Braxton has gotten under all their skin. When they get back to the buses, Braxton's bus is being towed away because of a radiator problem. So now Braxton is back to bunking with the boys again until her bus is fixed. Houston leads Braxton back to the bus, making her feel right at home, which obviously is him being a dick. Lauren has disappeared again, and Houston sends Rich to find him. Common trends. So Lauren is currently buying weed from Danielle, who is their assistant. We also learn that she's trans, which I thought was a cool thing. I loved that. Lauren just is kind of like a low-key dick in the seed, but like not... Like, in a heartfelt way? Like, in a, they have a good friendship and that's just kind of their dynamic? Right. So, Rich finds Lauren and confronts him about what he's doing and how he's just going to make everyone else miserable. Because he is falling apart. Like, he is a ticking time bomb. Rich also confronts Lauren about him telling Braxton about Emily when she was asleep. Lauren then learns that Rich has also hooked up with Braxton and he's obviously not thrilled at that either. This I thought was kind of funny and cute. We learned that Lauren was behind Braxton's bus breaking down. I loved that. <laughs> I was like, okay, for once, his antics, I'm okay with. Because I'm like, good. She shouldn't have been on that bus anyway. Braxton wakes up the next morning and she's feeling some of her trauma sneaking up on her. The words like whore, sinner, doomed are all kind of like making residence within her mind. But she's also really loved every moment of being with Houston and Rich. Braxton gets up from her bunk to head to the bathroom when Lauren stops her in her tracks and pulls her into his bunk with him. He's just giving Braxton a hard time, and we learn that Houston is big, but Rich is bigger in that, you know, dick department, and that she's thinking that one of them has to have a small dick because she can feel Lauren's dick pressed against her Mm because they're kind of spooning in the bunk, and I don't think that that's what she's feeling. So she's kind of like, of course, they all have big dicks. Like, really? Personality-wise, they're all big dicks, so why not have one hanging between their legs? Right? She then asks Lauren if he's jealous of Rich, and he says he doesn't answer stupid questions. (laughs) (laughs) So Braxton and Lauren finally fall back asleep, and Braxton wakes up with Lauren spooning her, and he's, like, gripping her boobs from behind. His, like, morning wood is all pressed up against her back. And Lauren calls her out on being awake. Lauren then asks if Braxton wants to play. And he lets her know that he's still pissed that she's fucked Houston and done stuff with Rich. And he also tells her that they'll never be exclusive now, but they can still have some fun. Which Braxton does not like that statement. She tries to get away from Lauren, but he pushes her back on the bed and crawls in between her legs. Lauren apologizes to Braxton, and Braxton says to prove it to her. So she wants to go sightseeing, and she wants Lauren to take her, but she also wants Rich and Houston to tag along as well. Plus, on top of this, Lauren has to be nice to all three of them all day. Which, like, I'm just like, <laughs> this bitch, I just, like, love her. Like, I love, she yes. is so great. She puts the boys in their place, and it's fantastic. I love to see it. They talk about how this isn't a good idea and kind of like we get some more insight on the friend's dynamic and how it's a little bit dysfunctional. A little little toxic right now. We learn that the boys started blaming each other for choices, even though that they made them together. Braxton gets up and she has another encounter with Houston in the kitchen on the bus where they're obviously just egging each other on again before the sightseeing trip. I'm like, why can't you guys just not talk to each other? Right. (laughs) And they end up making out, and the kiss is over before Braxton wants it to be. So she's just so confused. She doesn't know. She's just like... It's very whiplash with Houston. Yeah, because he's, like, telling her that, you know, all like, these horrible things. Like, but then you he, suck. I don't want you here. Like, But then he's, like, pulling her closer, and he's the one that's making all these moves on her. It's like... Because he's instigated all of he's it. He's instigated all of it, yes. So the Bound Group has finally set out on their sightseeing trip for the day. And Rich feels like this is just getting weird. So Braxton is no longer hiding the fact that she's attracted to all three guys and is just kind of going along with it. To give you an idea of what going along with it means, four of them are in the car and Lauren and Braxton are in the back making out as Houston is driving. (laughs) Like, no fucks anymore. Like, okay. Rich is thinking a little bit more about Emily as the group finally 
make their way to the zoo. So Rich is also kind of battling with his shit involving his wife that we still really don't know anything about. Yeah. We don't really know anything about Emily. So Braxton is very much enjoying this excursion and everything seems fine and everything's going pretty good. Braxton then reaches out and starts to hold Rich's hand as the four of them are continuing their zoo day. And then they start just full out kissing each other in front of like the tour guide, in front of workers, in front of the other bandmates. And then Xavier is like immediately like NDAs. NDAs, NDAs, NDAs. NDAs, NDAs, NDAs. NDAs, NDAs. (laughs) Braxton then asks Jericho to take her somewhere, just the two of them, where they can be alone. He leads them to a darkened area where they continue their makeout session and it quickly progresses as they tear each other's clothes off. And as Braxton is begging Jericho just to go faster because she wants to be with him. Because she's like, I appreciate that you want to like have foreplay, but like, fuck me. I need you in me right now. I'm just like, okay, girl. But Braxton is always like dripping wet. So I guess she doesn't even need foreplay. That's cool. Good for you. (laughs) Must be nice. Um, Jericho then fucks her from behind against the wall at the zoo for the first time. Rich is definitely getting more and more feelings towards Braxton, and he comes pretty quickly, and he apologizes, but Braxton doesn't mind. And it's also kind of like um, a rough fuck. Jericho then goes down on her before leaving their secluded spot. Because she obviously didn't fin- like finish. I think... They probably had were only having sex for, like, maybe five minutes. Like, that's how, like, he just couldn't hold it in. Yeah, because doesn't he wind up saying later, it only took me three pumps or something like that? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. It happens to everyone. <laughs> even, even rock stars in romance novels. So, relatable. <laughs> Braxton has no idea what she's doing, but she has no intention of stopping either. It was obvious what Rich and her had been up to. And it kind of ruined the mood for the rest of the day. More so for Lauren, and then Lauren starts taking it out on everybody else. Yeah. Braxton even calls Lauren out to stop pouting because she doesn't belong to anyone. Because he's acting like she's his possession. Lauren then gets in Braxton's face and says that he's the only one that's been able to admit that he has feelings for her. And that Houston still denies her because she'll always come second to bound and that she might want to open her eyes with Rich because he will never belong to her. After that, they drive back to the buses in silence. I don't really think that there's much to say. Braxton is now trying to figure out what she's going to do. Seducing was the easy part, but what does she do now that feelings are involved with multiple people? I don't know, girl. (laughs) You're on your own. (laughs) Braxton then announces to the boys that they are done and that she only wants to keep the relationship about the music. Houston makes the call, saying that if that's what she wants, then that's obviously what's going to happen. This obviously doesn't go over well with Lauren and Jericho, because, you know, Houston is playing leader without really consulting anybody else. A week has passed, and Braxton has stuck to her guns, and Lauren is now just realizing that she's for real. So at this point, it's also been three weeks since the tour has officially started. In the past week, Braxton has made herself pretty scarce. They're currently in New Orleans, so Lauren has brought Braxton back some tasty treats from Café du Monde. Mm, some beignets. The beignets are so good. But she politely declines and quickly leaves the bus after that. So the boys have a discussion about how to get things back on track with Braxton And they come to the conclusion that they have to change her mind somehow. Their plan is to wear her down by giving her what she wants. And that means leaving her alone completely. They all know that this is going to piss her off, but they're going for the reverse psychology on this one. They all agree that this is what they're going to do to get her back. Lauren then goes on social media and sees that Braxton has posted a picture of her eating a beignet at Café du Monde, which pisses him off. And he can't resist, and he comments petty on her picture, which instantly gets her him blocked again. <laughs> just, Lauren's only child bratty antics are just so fucking funny. So then it gets better, though. He then goes to an account that he's made for when he's blocked and leaves the comment, you look like your pussy tastes better. And isn't the, like, isn't the handle of that, like, 
Braxton Lowe forever. forever yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just so funny, though. It's just, he, he'll do anything. He, he has no shame. And I kind of love it. Oh, like, me too. It's definitely over the top and gets quite annoying at times, but it's just, it's so funny and I love it. Same. So the last thing that the boys discuss is once their plan has worked, how do they decide who wins Braxton? And Houston thinks that it should be in her hands, but Rich has a better plan, which is that they should share her. The married one wants <laughs> to share <laughs> <sighs> Braxton returns later that evening and heads to the shower and Lauren obviously digs through her shit to get to her phone and is finally able to get into her account. The password being Lauren is a dick. He's going through her phone and all of her pictures and he comes across some of her nudes. And then Rich also happens to peek and see what he's looking at and they're both not bothered. I guess it was a really good nude. They both liked it. Braxton comes out of the shower wearing very little clothing, which Lauren obviously notices right away. He forgets about the plan and talks to her and asks her about her day in Cafe Du Monde. And she really doesn't give him much and just like says goodnight and rolls over. Braxton is still awake while Rich has been snoring, so he's obviously asleep. And Houston's breathing has also turned deep. So Lauren decides the time is perfect. He reaches under his pillow and brings out some lube he squirts it on his hand, pulls down his boxers, and starts touching himself, not being secretive or quiet about it, in hopes of Brax realizing what's going on. He even calls out her name a few times. He then pulls out the second item, which is a pair of purple panties, which belong to Braxton, and he comes and cleans himself off with them and then just tosses them on the floor and goes to bed. So the band has finished up their show in New Orleans and they have completed the meet and greet as Braxton immediately heads back for the buses. Lauren is becoming impatient with this plan that the guys have come up with and wants to know if they've waited long enough. And the answer is no, according to Houston. Lauren's just pissed because he's the only one who hasn't gotten his dick wet yet. Seriously, that's, that's really the reason. They let Braxton have a little bit of space and head to the buses before them, but they don't wait super long. As they get back to the bus, they find Braxton completely naked on the couch, grinding onto Lauren's pillow. It was obviously planned, and she has no intention of stopping until she has completed her plan. She speeds up and finally comes all over the pillow as the three of the boys just continue to stare at her. And when she's done, she stands up, grabs the pillow, and tosses it at Lauren's feet. And then just disappears into the bunks without saying anything. Payback's a bitch. Don't fuck with Braxton. They should know this by now. Rich is also now not sure how much longer he can keep this up because he really just wants to be with Braxton. He's walking through the bunk area and spots a purple lace thong on the ground and he picks it up not realizing that it is covered in jizz. He's about to storm into the shower to confront Braxton until he runs into Lauren where Lauren admits that it was his doing. He then tells Rich exactly what he did with those panties, and they put together that what happened last night with Braxton was retaliation for Lauren. Rich gets really upset and pushes Lauren up against the wall and says that he has to leave her alone or he's out of the deal. Rich tries to get Lauren to understand that they are a package deal, and in order for this to work, all of them have to be successful. If one of them fails, all of them fail. And like, this is another, like, rich, like, showing that aggression. Mm -hmm. Like, for good. Like, he's, he's trying to, like... finally taking charge and not being the pushover. Yeah. And, like, the boys also are seeing this change in him. Houston joins them, and they end up having a little bit of a conversation. They smoke some weed, and then they decide to play some poker. This gives Rich some nostalgia about how things used to be between them. Braxton comes back out to get dinner and kind of just ignores them and watches TV. The boys continue playing poker as Braxton watches her movie. During this time, Lauren texts the group chat some things about Braxton of like how to get her attention that she then sees like on her way to bed and like reads. And the boys are pissed because it obviously like wasn't great. And the boys kick Lauren out for the night and tell him that he needs to find another place to sleep. And he does. They're like, get out. <laughs> We're tired of your antics right now. Leave. 
So Braxton's bus has been fixed, but Houston has decided not to exile her again and has given it back to the crew. Braxton started to notice the difference between the guys of like them kind of avoiding her. She notices that they're still arguing, but something has definitely changed. She's kind of picking up on something weird that's going on. She also calls them Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup, which I just thought was so funny. Like the Powderpuff love, Girls. Yeah. Like, I love that. It was great. I just like, and it was like an internal monologue. Mm-hmm. But I just like, the first time I read it, I like laughed at it. So I was like, that's funny. Yeah, because obviously Houston's going to be Blossom. Lauren's going to be Bubbles. And Rich is Buttercup. Obviously. Like, yeah. 1,000%. It matches them perfectly. It's kind of funny. It's ridiculous. But at the end of the day, she is really, like, missing them. Braxton hasn't talked to her parents since the tour started, since they're not picking up their phone. And she hasn't been able to talk to her sister, Rosalie, either, even though she's been able to sneak some DMs here and there to Rosalie. At this point on the tour, they're actually staying in a hotel And Braxton is excited to have a full-size bed again. And they each kind of have their own rooms, it sounds like. I think um, Lauren and Jericho have to share. Yeah, they're like Like, in a suite. Yeah, but it's like the penthouse. Like they're not – it's not a rough situation. Braxton makes her way downstairs to head out to do some sightseeing when Houston stops her and asks her where she's going. They then inform her that they have given their security time off so they will not be able to leave the hotel, especially with Braxton's fame steadily increasing. Houston also calls her out, saying that it's been two months and that she's made her point, but Braxton says that she doesn't think she has yet. All three of the boys are kind of teasing her, saying that she has some pent-up energy, and she tells them not to worry about it because it's being taken care of. Obviously, Lauren being Lauren freaks out and demands to know what she means by that. Lauren then demands that she tells him who this person is so they can beat him up because they're spoiled, possessive, and jealous and only like to share with each other. That's what he tells her. She's kind of like, what the fuck? When did that change? (laughs) She's like, huh? (laughs) Houston then says they have an experiment that they would like to propose to her, but she says that she's not playing their games and that she's okay with not knowing what their proposition is. Lauren tries to stop her, but she just makes her way back to her room Glancing back one last time to see Rich sitting with his head kind of bowed down, Lauren's like tensed shoulders, and Houston staring out the window. Boo hoo, rock stars don't get their way. (laughs) Aw, sad boys. So the boys are still downstairs discussing how epically awful that went (laughs) and saying that they're that they've been iced out for two months and it might take some a little bit of time for her to be open to hearing what they have to say. They get into a little bit of a disagreement and Rich storms off. Lauren and Houston then have a conversation about how the situation couldn't work and that it's not how love works with three guys sharing one girl. Houston is the one defending the situation and the experiment, saying that their family, that they've built a career together, they share a house together, they don't even have separate bank accounts, and what's his has always been theirs, so what's different Like, what's the difference with love? They go, they then go on discussing how they're both worried about Braxton in this situation because the girl is always going to endure more of shit during a scandal like this. And the fact that she'll be sharing multiple guys is definitely not going to be easy on her. Houston then tells Lauren to go and make up with Rich because he's always been Braxton's favorite. So that was kind of sweet of Houston. This is the point in the book where I start to actually like like Houston. Houston. Same. Like, I'm starting, he's he's starting to not be such a dick. He's growing on me. Yeah. Braxton has been eavesdropping on Houston and Lauren's whole conversation about her. So now she knows the general gist of what their experiment is. And she ends up sneakily slipping out of the hotel room to explore New York City before dawn. She's making her way along as she's thinking about the situation that she's found herself in and starts to form an idea. She ends up taking a selfie and making sure to capture some of the background and decides to send this to them. The caption states, I decided to take a walk. Find me before sunrise and I'll grant five minutes of my undivided attention. She then sends that text to the group chat and figures that she has about 20 minutes head start. So Lauren gets woken up by Houston, informing him Braxton is gone and to check his text. 
They begin their hide-and-go-seek mission to find Braxton, and they are all quite game and excited for this. After continuing a cold trail, they come up with a plan to cut Braxton off, which works, and Lauren decides to claim the five minutes of undivided Mm -hmm. attention. Of course he does. He does not use this time to have a conversation. Oh, no. And, like, you know, trying to get her to be their girlfriend. He wants physical attention instead. (laughs) Can't really blame him, though. He is the only one who who hasn't hasn't gotten it. Yep. So Braxton attempts to run from him, but gets caught and taken to the ground and kissed. Houston hands Lauren a condom and tells him to make it count. Rich's request is that he wants to see Braxton's tits. (laughs) Oh, my God. This scene is so funny. Lauren begins going to town on Braxton, as he has until sunup to finish, while Houston and Rich look on and do their best to block and, you know, give them some privacy, because they're in the middle of Central Park. As they change positions and Braxton begins riding Lauren, Rich gets his dick out, and Braxton begins giving him a handjob, and the boys learn she's ambidextrous. <laughs> They got them real excited. (laughs) This part was so funny to me. Lauren winds up passing out in the park after he comes. (laughs) Because he's not also a morning person. Yeah. So, like, yeah, he's tired. He's tired. He finally... He's sleepy. He finally has his release. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's just, like, passed out, (laughs) dick out still. Classic rock star. When they get back to the hotel, Houston declares, we need to talk. Braxton's response is, is the topic about the next show? Didn't think so. Thanks for the orgasms and walks off to her bedroom. An enraged Lauren goes after her and starts like banging on her door. And she she won't open it for him. But he is just like going to town on that door. They had their five minutes. They didn't use it wisely. No. Nope. And she's back to, they're back to how they have been. So Rich goes up. And apologizes for being a jerk. And he gets Braxton to open the door for him. And he hands her a wig. And says, you know, that they're going to go have a little adventure. He winds up taking her to the wax museum to see, like, the wax figures of Bound. At the museum, Rich opens up to Braxton about the relationship between the band and Calvin, their former guitar player. And he lets her know that he's falling in love with her. Rich next takes her to dinner and finds out Braxton is not wearing any panties, which always gets him turned on. When he calls her out on this, like on the car ride, like to the dinner, she's like, I knew I was forgetting something. (laughs) She's such a brat sometimes. I love Love it. it. When they return to the hotel, Braxton shares all about her sightseeing and shows them pictures. Lauren gets very upset about his wax figure because they made the nose, like, a little too large. (laughs) And he gets super pissed off about it. Very butthurt over this wax figure. (laughs) But Braxton thinks it's hilarious. And that's why she took a picture of it because she knew it was going to piss him off. And, you know, she also shares a video of her getting eaten out by Rich in the car. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that does happen. She didn't want them to feel left out, right? Yeah. Houston requests to spend the night with Braxton. She agrees, but she lets it be known. No sex. The two spend the night together just sleeping, and in the morning, Houston apologizes for not realizing what he had before it was too late. Basically, for being a dick this whole time. And then he asks her to be his girlfriend. Oh, so sweet. And Braxton tells him to give her a reason. We get a time jump. A little bit of blue balls from the give me a reason thing. That could have been another sex scene. And back on the tour bus, the boys decide to give Braxton the bedroom. So, like, there's bunks in the tour bus where they all normally sleep. But then, like, in the back, there's, like, a bedroom with, like, a king-size bed and the bathroom that they all share. That bedroom is normally what they use when they, like, bring back groupies Mm -hmm. kind of situation. It's the sex room. It's the sex room. So the boys decide that they're going to give... Braxton in the bedroom, signaling that they won't be needing it because they have no sexual desire for any groupies. They only want Braxton. Lauren winds up being able to take Braxton out to dinner where he gives, like, a very, very heartfelt apology. Like, he's pouring his heart out to Braxton at this dinner and asks her to forgive him 
and she lets him know she's working on it. Rich and Houston crash the dinner, and Braxton learns the story behind the medallion that Lauren's always wearing, and he kind of gives it to her, but they still haven't gotten Braxton to be theirs yet. Back on the bus, the boys have decided they're done waiting on Braxton to agree and decide to pull the yes out of her sexually. Of course it's sexually. <laughs> the three of them begin to crowd Braxton in the bedroom. Houston puts her on his lap. Lauren rips her panties off. She calls him out on this and is like, that's two you owe me now. And Houston gives the command for Lauren to eat her pussy until she gives them what they came for. Rich joins in on the buffet de Brax puss, and Houston commands her to watch, and she tells the boys to do their worst. Time for nice guy Rich to take over. He has the biggest dick of the three of them and is a relentless lay. Rich gives Braxton no mercy as he fucks her while the other two watch on and taunt Braxton. After multiple orgasms, she can't take it much more and wants Rich to come. And he responds with, then you know what to do. Psychological war warfare. <laughs> right? Jesus. Braxton finally relents and says yes to being their girl. Of course, Rich makes her scream yes a few times. Like, make, He's like, I don't think they heard you. Say it louder. You need to say it again, girl. <laughs> Lauren starts kissing her and promising to be the best boyfriend. And Houston goes to the bathroom and like gets a wet rag and like starts cleaning her up. Aftercare. Yes. And they all fall asleep together in the same bed. How sweet. A big spoon. A big spoon. <laughs> the next morning, Braxton is the first to wake up, and she is greeted with a visit from Oni sitting at the table. This is not a pleasant or wanted visit by the rest of the band, and she lets it be known that she's there for the show and to make sure things are going all right. And they are not hiding the fact that they are all in a relationship together now. No. I guess each one wakes up and, like, sees Oni and Braxton. They're, like, kissing her and... It's very obvious what's yeah. going on. And yes. Oni's just probably just looking at, like, what the fuck is this? Well, they've never wanted to hide it. So, like, Braxton finally gave them the go that they're, like, officially in a couple. And, like, the boys are not going to hide that any longer. The night of the show, Braxton gives Houston a pre-show blowjob before going on stage. And while they're all in Braxton's dressing room, they start talking about how this relationship arrangement is going to work. When the show is over and everyone is back on the bus, Rich gets a call about Emily, his wife. So Houston distracts Braxton with sex so he can take the call in private without her finding out. Lauren attempts to convince him to be honest with Braxton about the Emily situation because this could ruin things for not just him, but for all of them with her. We get like a little hint that there's something more to this whole Rich and Emily thing because like Emily has been like missing for a while and like Rich has hired like a private investigator to try to find her because he's been like trying to have divorce papers delivered to her for years. So there's definitely, you know, more to the story and it's not like they are in a this is not a healthy functioning relation. Like, they are estranged. Yeah. Rich does agree to back off Braxton and not initiate anything sexually with her until he tells her about Emily. And the conversation doesn't go that great. So a frustrated Lauren goes and uh, alleviates himself between Braxton's thighs. It's time for the Canada leg of the tour. And they have to abandon the bus again. Uh, and we find out Braxton doesn't do too well on planes. But thankfully, she has three boyfriends to help soothe her anxiety. And they all do take care of her. They do. When they get to Vancouver, uh, it's time for a group date, which is jet skiing. Braxton is noticing and not liking the distance that Rich is keeping from her. They decide to have a jet ski race. And the first one back to the dock gets to choose a dare for the loser. Braxton rides with Houston. During the race, Braxton winds up getting thrown off the jet ski, and Rich rescues her. Rich and Braxton wind up being the first back to the dock. To lighten the mood, Braxton declares them the winner of the race. When they return to the hotel, the boys surprise Braxton by running her a bath and washing her together very sensually and putting her to bed for a nap. Hmm. 
Once they leave the room, Braxton receives an unexpected phone call. So the phone call winds up being from Braxton's parents, informing her that her younger sister, Rosalie, is in the hospital. So the show for the next couple of days winds up getting canceled, and Braxton and the guys are on a plane going to Faithful, which is Braxton's hometown. At the hospital, the guys can tell there's a definite shift in Braxton's demeanor, not only because she's, you know, very concerned for what's going on with her sister because her parents haven't given her much information, just like, you need to come home, your sister's in the hospital. But they can tell she's, like, super not okay being back. Yeah, she's probably very anxious. Yeah, and they can pick up on her vibes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the hospital, she's, you know, gets confronted by... Dear old mom and dad. It's not a great conversation. No. Their relationship is not great. It's not great at all. Like, Braxton is definitely, like, the black sheep of the family and has kind of been, like, run out of their hometown. Like, her and her parents really get into it at this point, and she's just like, look, I just want to see my sister. She's there for a little while, but things get, like, so heated with her parents that they just have to leave. So her and the boys wind up getting a motel room for the night and they're like tell us what's going on and Braxton's just like I have a sister Rosalie so the previous night as Alex was saying Braxton refused to talk to the boys about her family slash Rosalie and Houston this morning is obviously very livid that they're in this situation and that they weren't kind of prepared for the situation Houston is on top of her in bed currently and slowly starts teasing Braxton. She tries to kiss him, but he's not having that. Houston then just slams into her and starts fucking her, but she doesn't get the chance to come before Houston is finishing up himself. Obviously, this pisses Braxton off and she thinks Houston is a dick because Houston then gets up and walks away leaving Braxton still in bed with a sleeping Jericho and Lauren. So she's kind of like, wow, that was my punishment for keeping something of my past a secret. Yeah, because, like, the boys get mad because they realize they don't know a whole lot about Braxton, how she grew up, or really anything about her, but she's demanded a lot from them. Yes. Yeah. So they're all kind of mad at her at this point. But that was not the way to go about handling it. She then notices movements and Rich ends up going down on her since Houston refused to finish her off. So Rich steps in and takes one for the team. (laughs) Oh, because, you know, it was just so hard, so so hard hard not to. They're now at church since this is Braxton's way of being able to see and talk to Rosalie. It's clear that her parents are not thrilled that she's still in town and at the service. So after the service, Braxton can tell when the boys have spotted her family by the looks on their faces when they see Rosalie, Braxton's 13-year-old sister, heavily pregnant, sporting a diamond ring on her left hand. So Rosalie comes over to the group and is super excited and happy to see her sister, but all Lauren can think about is how fucked up the situation is and just... I I think it it, threw everyone. It threw everyone for a loop. They don't even know, like, the details of it, but they're like, this is fucked. Yeah. Lauren and Rosalie's fiancé slash husband have a little bit of an interaction where Lauren does not hold back his disgust towards Pete, who is said fiancé slash husband. Rosalie then apologizes to Braxton, knowing that she's upset with her, but that she's okay and, like, she did end up making this decision and that she hopes that Braxton can forgive her. They have a conversation about how this wasn't what what Rosalie wanted, but Rosalie was afraid of losing her parents, and she knows she'll never really lose Braxton. So that's why she went along with the situation that she's in now. So it's just, like, really sad. The guys want answers, so Braxton fills them in on some of her past surrounding guitar and how she got into it. She proceeds to tell them the story of how she met an older guy named Jacob who was in a band. Him and his bandmates got into a really bad car accident and everyone died but Jacob and he was left in a coma for about six months after the accident. Braxton decided to befriend him and she was on her way home from school one day when she heard him playing guitar in his garage and she enters his space and just kind of like watches him play and neither of them like say anything and then she leaves and then she left. 
She continued to do this for a few days until finally he asked her if she played and she responded maybe one day. He then started to slowly teach her how to play guitar and became kind of like a student teacher mentor type of thing. She then tells the guys that she ended up sleeping with him. She was 16 and he was 36. She promises that she came onto him and that she hadn't been taken advantage of. Obviously, the guys are not thrilled about this and ask if he's still unfaithful. She then tells them that she promised that she would never say anything about it. Um, but he ultimately skipped town and she never saw him again. Braxton shares that she struggled after he left because she used him as a crutch. And now that he was gone, she was slowly spiraling. So three months after she slept with Jacob and he had left town, she had seduced 12 other boys from her parish and her parents found out. One of the boys feared for his soul because, um, because he slept with her and he came forward and eight more boys or guys confessed to sleeping with her as well. She was allowed to atone for her behavior by standing before the altar for three days without food, water, or sleep so that people, so that the people of Faithful could be restored and comforted by her sacrifices. This was absolutely fucked up. Yeah, this whole story, I was just like, what? Like, in the world. I hated it so much. And so did the guys because they want names of all of the guys that came forward because they want to deal with them. And obviously Braxton's like, no, I'm not fucking giving you their names. Are you crazy? Like, it's in the past. Like, let it go kind of thing. This conversation has brought the group closer and they ask if she is ready for them, essentially. And she says yes. She says she's finally all in, I think. Like, this is kind of the moment where she is, like, fully invested. They are now officially, officially a couple. They were a couple before, but I think that it's really solidified after this encounter. Very much so. In this story. So after their show in Seattle, Seattle, they're headed back to Portland. The boys have convinced her to come back with them to their place instead of L.A. during a little bit of a break that they have. They arrive at the guy's house, and it's a beautiful, gothic, Victorian, like, very dark house that Braxton falls in love with instantly. Lauren then welcomes her to the treehouse and says no girls are allowed, but they'll make an exception for her. Rich leads her to a room with a big bed with some really nice drapes, very gothic vibes. Rich then lays down, bringing Braxton with him so that she's straddling him on top. They're kind of just, like, hanging out, kind of slowly, like, kissing and, like, Rich is kind of, like, falling into sleep. Like, it's just, like, a a chill moment just for the two of them. Houston then enters the room, and he lifts Braxton off of Jericho and takes off all of her clothes. Houston starts touching her and kissing her neck as she whispers yours to him. Houston then orders Braxton to sit on Rich's face as he is fingering her. Rich is now fully awake and on board, and he lets her just climb right back up onto his face. Love it. Um, Houston then leaves the room and Braxton really starts to ride his face, enjoying everything that's he's bringing her. Houston then re-enters the room just in time to watch her finish. He then warns Braxton that they aren't through yet. They let her know that they are both going to fuck her now. And yes, at the same time. But they promise that they're going to take care of her. She does ask where Lauren is, and he's in the shower taking one of his, like, hour-long showers. I feel like he has, like, a three-hour shower. (laughs) Oh, yeah. He's probably – that water bill is probably so expensive. She also informed them that they don't need to use condoms anymore unless they really want to since she's on birth control. But she wants to fill them without any barriers, and they're very quick with tossing the condoms as well. They're getting her ready and prepared as she is now straddling Rich – And he enters her from beneath her. Houston then starts also preparing her to fit him. So he is also fingering her while Rich is inside of her. So we we get a really good double penetration scene where both Rich and Houston enter the V at the same time. And they're all loving it. She 
also gets an overwhelming smell of vanilla and berries, but she notices that something or an element is missing within this like scent. So also kind of to wrap your head around, not only are Rich and Houston fucking Braxton, but Rich and Houston are also kind of like... Their dicks are touching. We're yeah. getting some sword play. Yeah, and Houston is being very aggressive and possessive towards Rich in the scene as well as Braxton. He's even like, Rich, come for me. Like, very... I was like, okay. Um, Here for it. Yeah. So they all end up coming, and then Houston cleans all of them up. I mean, teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. Or makes the orgasm work. Exactly. In this case. During this time, Braxton is still thinking about something that is missing, and that something is Lauren. So both Rich and Houston fall asleep, but she's unable to. Lauren enters the bedroom, and he can tell that something happened between the three of them, and he's kind of sad that he missed it. And Braxton's even like, I didn't tell you to take such a fucking long shower. The first night that we're in Portland, like, on tour, like... On a break. Like, come on, dude. Lauren then tells Braxton that she owes him, and they end up making out in bed next next to a passed out Houston and Rich. One thing leads to another, and they end up having the sex as well. I don't know. Her if I v- can... her vag must have been in so much pain. Yeah, I but don't she know sucked if I could have done it after a DP thing. I know. She sucked it up though. She's gotta make all her boyfriends happy. Sacrifice. <laughs> You know what? Hats off to you, Braxton, because it's a no for me. The next day or so, the three of the boys are showing Braxton around the house. Lauren kind of makes a joke about her moving in permanently, which she shuts down pretty hard. Her and Lauren get into a little bit of a fight over this, and she heads back to her room, and Houston has to stop Lauren from following. The band is now in their practice room, and Braxton has finally come back out of her room. Since Houston texts her letting her know what they were up to. Houston then lets Braxton read over a song that he's written. Houston wants Braxton to help them come up with the melody. And so they have her sing the song and her interpretation of it. Just as Braxton is done finishing up singing, Lauren's phone rings and Houston knows exactly who's calling and tells him not to answer it. They then get into an argument over Lauren's dad and how he is Lauren's problem and that they should just let him deal with it. Lauren takes a shot at Houston below the belt and compares Houston to his dad and how they're both very controlling and how they're essentially the same. Lauren then storms out of the practice room and Braxton follows. Rich then lets Houston know that he's meeting with his lawyer tomorrow and then he's going to tell Braxton about Emily. It's about damn time. It's been a week since the American leg of the tour has ended and they've been in Portland. And Rich is back to being distant again, and Braxton has noticed. Braxton finds Houston in the kitchen as he is reading some research online, and this is the first time that Houston or anyone has brought up the fact that Braxton has synesthesia. And they also mention chromesthesia. Braxton then shares how she has always been able to associate her emotions to both smells and tastes. So here's kind of like the breakdown of her most common ones. So desire tastes like cherries, shame smells like olives, happiness tastes like chocolate, sorrow smells like roses. Lauren then enters the kitchen and Rich is missing again in action as the group is getting ready to go somewhere. Braxton is done waiting, so she ends up texting Rich, asking where he is, and he says he's home. So Braxton comes straight out and asks if he's avoiding her and he says yes and that they need to talk later. Braxton wants to talk now, but he's like, no, later. Houston then tries to reassure Braxton that it's not what she thinks and that Rich hasn't gotten over her because that's her main fear. Lauren and Houston take Braxton around Portland, kind of showing her important places, such as the place they played their first gig at. Braxton is still having some doubts about the relationship and how it's really going to work out. Once they return, Braxton goes off and searches for Rich and she finds him sleeping in her room. She starts getting ready for bed and finds Jericho is now awake, but won't acknowledge her or answer her. He leaves the room and Braxton follows, and it takes her a while to figure out that he is sleepwalking. He leads her to the attic section, like this tower section of their house, where he's looking at some paper and like scribbling aggressively. He then gets up and leaves the attic 
and she goes over to see what he's looking at, and she smells roses. Lauren wakes up the next morning to Houston loudly, like, banging through the house, walking around. And, you know, Lauren's not a morning person. So Lauren and Rich both end up waking up and following the noise that Houston is making, which is towards Braxton's room. Once they get to her room, there is a stack of papers with a knife jabbed in the middle of them, and it says, Happy Anniversary. Rich puts it together that it's September 3rd, which is his wedding anniversary to Emily. And as they investigate the papers, they realize that Braxton has found Jericho and Emily's divorce papers that are still not signed. It also shows that there is a child involved in this divorce. They also realize that all of Braxton's stuff is gone from her room. Lauren calls Braxton and asks her to come back because he loves her, but she's not convinced and says that she doesn't negotiate with liars and hangs up. Rich tells Lauren that Braxton has been spotted at the airport and they are going to try to cut her off before she gets to L.A., So that doesn't end up happening, but they do end up making it to L.A., and they know Braxton has made it home to her apartment, and they have been outside for some time now trying to get her attention and have her open the door. Griffin finally opens the door, in which Lauren calls her Grendel. He's always fucking up her name. It's so funny. It's like, (laughs) all right, Griffin door. Yeah, it's so funny. And also such a Lauren thing. And like just so many other things he just completely gets wrong every single time. Seriously, it's so funny. And she says that Braxton doesn't want to talk to them and slams the door in their face. They decide that they're not leaving LA until they can talk to Braxton. But they do leave her apartment after the encounter with Griffin. It takes five days of trying and failing to see Braxton. So the boys decide to break into her apartment one evening when the girls are out on the town and wait for Braxton to come home. The girls finally get back and don't realize that they have company for a few minutes until they enter the living room and turn the lights on. Obviously, Braxton is pissed that they broke in and she wants them to leave. Rich apologizes for not telling her about Emily, but offers to tell her everything now. We learn that Emily slept with Calvin once Jericho and her were married. So their old guitarist, his wife slept with. He also tells Braxton that it's been over four years since he's heard or seen from Emily. Braxton still wants to know why he lied, and Rich admits that there was a possibility that he wasn't ever going to leave Emily if the baby was his. At this point, Rich does not know anything about the child, but if it was his, he wasn't going to divorce her. This is obviously a shock and news for both Houston and Lauren, who are also now extremely pissed that Rich kept that from them. This is a breaking point for Lauren, and he ends up storming out of Braxton's apartment and is done with the relationship and with Bound. There's a press release stating that the Bound tour has been postponed, and there are rumors circulating that Braxton, Bound's newest guitarist, is potentially dating all three of her bandmates. It's been 23 days since the encounter with Braxton at her apartment, Braxton has shut down, Lauren has run back to Portland and to his dad, and Rich has been a ghost and hasn't spoken since Braxton's apartment. Houston has decided to go and finally see Lauren, so he goes to Lauren's parents' house. The always put-together Lauren is looking pretty terrible at this point, (laughs) and he is not taking this breakup well. Houston is trying to get Lauren to come back because he knows that they can get through everything if Lauren comes. Houston finally convinces Lauren to take a shower and come with him for Braxton's hearing that's happening today with the record label. As Houston is waiting for Lauren to get ready, he has an encounter with Orson, who is Lauren's dad, who is a pre- like, a huge dick. He is trying to scare Houston off. Thankfully, that doesn't happen. Lauren shows up and they head back for Braxton's hearing, not before a given- Mr. James, the good old finger on their way out of the driveway. They get to the office and walk into the meeting in which they were not invited to. And this is kind of creating a deja vu moment from Braxton's first appearance. Because they are now interrupting a meeting. Yeah, it's like full circle at this point. Carl is obviously pissed that they're here. And Braxton ends up asking what happens to the guys if she backs out on tour. No one is planning on answering her until Oni speaks up, 
pretty much in short saying that if they don't finish the tour, it would bankrupt them because of how much money Bound owes the record label. There's also like other clauses about like merch sales and like their music. The guys didn't want Braxton to know this because they didn't want her to sacrifice her happiness and feel obligated. And they only wanted her to continue if she actually wanted to, not because she was coerced into it. But ultimately, she says that she'll finish the damn tour. Griffin is extremely pissed at Braxton for giving in and committing to the rest of the tour, but Braxton can't let them get hurt by the record label either. Braxton has also started catching on that Griffin and Mako have started a relationship, but they have not told her yet. But she's been aware of, like, their crush on each other for a while, and she's been waiting for this to happen, so she's, like, super excited and kind of, like, Yeah, but she's just waiting for them to say something. So Griffin comes up with a decision that her and Mako are going to go on part of the European leg of the tour in hopes of keeping Braxton company and keeping her mind off the boys and probably being like cock blocks. Later that evening, Rich ends up calling Braxton and he tells her that she doesn't need to do this and he also tells her that Emily is not his wife anymore. Unfortunately, Braxton's trust has been lost in all of them and Rich asks if she forgives him. She tells all three, because she knows that this is a speaker call, (laughs) that she's on speaker, that they all freed her, but she can't trust them right now. Lauren then lets her know that they hear her, but that this is not over. Bound is back on tour, and Rich and the boys are just kind of bidding their time until Griffin and Mako leave them, like, leave the tour, because they have been a very successful shield for Braxton so far. But it can't last because they have to go home at some point. They're checking into their hotel. Tensions are still really high. Rich asks if Lauren's willing to talk to him yet because Lauren is still very pissed at Rich about the whole Emily ordeal. He hasn't gotten over it. And he says no and that he's pretty much dead to him. Rich, being fed up, decides to put Lauren in a headlock and ask if he's ready to listen now. He said he was never going to choose Emily over Braxton. He just needed time to figure out himself and that marrying Emily was not choosing her over Lauren either. We learn that Lauren tried to convince Rich not to marry Emily because he deserved better and kind of saw through her. He then also tells Jericho that Emily tried to sleep with Houston a week after they they were married and Houston demanded that Emily tell him. Obviously, Emily did not tell Rich, so this was new information. Rich also blames Lauren for Emily cheating on him with Calvin, but Lauren is convinced that that would have happened regardless if he left them alone that night or not. Rich then tells Lauren that he already requested the grant of the divorce between him and Emily before Braxton found the papers, and he tells them that they need to kiss and make up so they can win their girl back. The following night, the boys slip into Braxton's suite with Griffin and Miko to get them for their next gig. After the show, they head to a club that Lauren found and they are led to the VIP section. Griffin and Miko head for the bar, but Braxton is not allowed to leave the VIP section since they don't have private security. As soon as the girls are gone, the boys cage Braxton in. Houston is the one who makes the first move and is kissing on her neck, but she kind of shoves him away. And there's some very hot and heavy, flirty, sexually driven conversation as the guys are trying their best to win back Braxton. Braxton kind of finally gives in as Lauren and Houston start to touch her in the middle of the VIP section in this club in Berlin. Lauren is in front of her and whips out his dick and enters her as Houston is holding her from the back, and Rich is blocking Braxton from the rest of the crowd. So yeah, public sex. Let's get it. Some more public sex. More public sex. Oh yeah, more public sex. So Braxton gets fucked by Lauren in the middle of the club as both Houston and Rich watch on. Lauren finishes, and as soon as he's done, Houston turns her around so she's facing him now, and he starts to fuck her up against the wall, Lauren and Rich now blocking Braxton from the view of the room. Braxton isn't hating this. Pass the puss. By anyway. Pass the puss. Pass, Pass the, the puss. puss. 
So once Houston is done, they ask Rich if he wants a turn, but he passes saying that him and Braxton need to talk before doing anything sexual, which I can really respect because they definitely do need to have a conversation. Oh, yeah. Found has made it to Paris, and it's been two weeks since the club in Berlin. Things aren't going great, and she hasn't totally forgiven them because she can't get over the fact that they lied. She gets a Twitter notification from at M underscore Anon, which says, you're going to die, bitch. But I guess these types of tweets have become pretty normal since her fame has increased. So she just like brushes it off. They're currently sightseeing at Chateau de Versailles when Rich approaches her. He asks if they can talk. And Braxton's first question is if he still loves Emily. And he says no, he loves her. Braxton feels like she is the reason why Rich is wanting a divorce. So she also kind of feels like the other woman. Rich promises that the two have no correlation. Rich then tells her that he stopped wanting Emily way before he ever met Braxton. He shares that Emily and him were only married for four months before she cheated with Calvin, and then only six months before she ran away because he told her if the baby wasn't his, he was done with her. She's been on the run ever since, and he hasn't been able to find her because she also likes having power over him. Like, Jericho was kind of her little puppet. Rich then confines in Braxton that he was an orphan and he never had a family. And so that is why if Emily's child was his, why he wouldn't divorce her because he wanted his kid to have a family that he never had. Which, I mean, it makes sense. But, like, you just need to talk about shit. He could why have explained hide that things? in the beginning. This is all very, like, Avoidable. reasonable. Yeah. He then apologizes for lying to her. Jericho gives Braxton one more kiss and says that it's okay that she doesn't forgive him and walks away. Braxton is back at the hotel staring at the view of the Eiffel Tower from their penthouse suite balcony. Must be nice. And she's waiting for Rich to return because he hasn't been seen since their conversation earlier. Houston tries to distract Braxton from Rich and his disappearance, so he asks her to accompany him to dinner. Houston has also picked out this elegant red gown and shoes for this excursion. Houston and Braxton make their way to this very fancy restaurant hand in hand. The restaurant is also in the Eiffel Tower. So very romantic. So jealous. I know, right? At dinner, Houston apologizes and says that he's sorry for not being a better man for her and a better friend to Rich. He should have fought harder for Rich to do the right thing earlier. Houston then admits that he is also in love with Braxton. Once they're done with dinner, they go and search for Jericho. Lauren finds Rich at the museum in Paris, and Rich tells Lauren that he's leaving bound because he just can't do it anymore. Lauren then tells him that he's not leaving, and they have more of a conversation about Emily and the kind of all that shit that's eating at both of them. Like, they're carrying a lot of baggage. Lots of baggage. Lauren was just there to stall him, giving Braxton and Houston time to find them as well. And Braxton asks him to stay and asks if he wants her anymore. And she says to prove it to her because he says, yes, I do want you. That's not the problem. And so she says, prove it. So Rich decides to stay and they, they all kind of make up a little bit. We get another bit of a time jump. It's been one year since the first meeting with Houston, Lauren and Jericho. And it's been three months since Paris where they've they've actually been having a good time and there hasn't been any more lies or secrets. Lauren has confided in Braxton about his past and how he convinced his mom to leave his father because his father's shitty and his dad pretty much kicked him out after that. He also confessed his part in potentially ruining Rich's marriage. Jericho has also told her more about his time in foster care, about meeting Emily, and about their like toxic relationship. They're back home in Portland, and they're on their way to meet Houston's grandmother, who is also who also was his legal guardian growing up. Braxton gets another tweet from that M underscore Anon account saying, watch your back, he's mine. Lauren finds Braxton in one of the old bedrooms at Houston's grandmother's house, and Lauren says that he's not, and Lauren can, um, kind of tells her that he's not picky about gender. As we were reading Lilac, we 
kind of saw undertones of throughout like, the whole book. Yeah, like sexual tension between the guys. More so Rich and Lauren. More so Rich and Lauren. But I also would sometimes get vibes with Houston and Lauren or Houston and Rich especially than, you know. Right. I always got the vibe with Houston as it being more so like he's just kind of accepting his friends and like plays into it because he like. Like, because he does threaten Lauren at one point being like, if you don't pull your shit together, I'm going to top you. Like, Mm -hmm. we now learn that Lauren is bi and that he's very, you know, gender doesn't really bother him. Yeah. Um, Here for it. Here for it. They have a heart to heart and Braxton ends up asking where Houston is. Rich then enters the room answering, saying that his grandmother and him have went to the store for groceries and that they're staying for dinner. Lauren wants to go down on Braxton and asks if he can But she says no, not here, since it's Houston's grandma's house. Rich says that she won't last another six days. And it's kind of like a taunt. So obviously Braxton takes this as a dare. She says they've made it clear that there are no other women involved in the relationship, but they've never set any boundaries on what they could do with each other within the relationship. Lauren is very much up for this, and so is Rich. So they start like kissing and making out. And Rich ends up taking out Lauren's dick and giving him a blowjob in which Lauren says that he forgot how good he was at this. So obviously this has happened before. Mm -hmm. Lauren then asks Braxton, who is just like watching this and is like very turned on by it as well, to get the lube that's in the nightstand for him. And she does. As Rich is giving him head, Lauren also apologizes to Rich. And like you could tell that this is kind of like an all-inclusive like I'm sorry for all this bullshit that we've kind of been through. Also during this, like, there's a lot of, like, dirty talk from Lauren and, like, aimed at Rich. It was good. I mean, it is. It's a very thorough sex scene. Rich says that he forgives Lauren and that he forgave him a long time ago. Rich asks for a distraction from Braxton since it's been a while since him and Lauren have done this. And he also whispers that he loves Braxton before sharing a kiss. So Lauren is now like spooning Rich from behind as Braxton and Rich are making out. And Lauren asks Braxton if she wants him to fuck Rich now. And she says, yes, I do. Please. And so they do. (laughs) Braxton asks Rich how it feels. And Lauren responds, you'll find out soon enough. (laughs) Oh, Lauren. Lauren, as he is having sex with Rich, orders him to also start fingering Braxton. Braxton is the first to come, followed by Rich coming all over, like, her stomach and probably, like, her tits and stuff, and Lauren finally coming in the condom. As soon as they're done, they hear Houston and his grandma returning from the grocery store, so just in time. Lots of perfect timing as far as these, like, sexual encounters. Yes. Later that evening, Houston asks if Braxton had fun and called her out for ending the hiatus when he wasn't around. She then tells Houston that they didn't actually have sex. At least she didn't have sex. (laughs) Houston then shares a news article clipping that states a double suicide paralyzes Portland, and it mentions a Jake Morrow and a Susan Morrow. They were pronounced dead from overdosing on antidepressants. Obviously, this is Houston's parents. And she asks if he was the one that found them, and he said yes. He talks to her about them and how everyone knew them as being this, like, contagious couple. They're always very energetic, always very fun, but it's always the most happy people who are the most sad. But he really doesn't know what happened or why they did what they did. After this deep conversation, Houston and Braxton fall asleep in each other's arms, missing dinner, and no one interrupts them. It's Houston's 29th birthday. And Braxton has plans to surprise him with his favorite cake that she's going to make herself with the help from his grandma. As Braxton is arriving to Lainey's house, she hears someone calling her name. She gets confronted by a woman with a bat who winds up being Emily, who starts bashing Braxton's head in with the bat. And she loses consciousness. Cut to the boys who get woken up by a loud firework sound. And as they make their way downstairs... Emily is waiting for them. Emily begins to plead with Rich to take her back, and she admits that she's had an abortion. Rich finally stands up for himself with Emily, and Houston and Lauren stick by his side. They are all confronting Emily 
and want to know where Braxton is, she starts wielding a gun at them and telling the guys that she killed Braxton. As Emily takes turns pointing the gun and threatening each guy, she ends on Rich, where she finally pulls the trigger. Braxton wakes up in the hospital. Her family is with her, and they are not allowing the guys to visit Braxton. Assholes. Braxton and her mom do share a heartfelt moment while in the hospital, and we get a story about Braxton when she was younger and struggling with her synesthesia, how she became obsessed with a lilac field that was near their house, and we realize that Braxton associates the smell of lilacs with love. Hence where the book comes from, like the title. I really liked that. I thought that was really cute. I thought it was so cute. Yeah, me too. I really liked that. And she realizes all the smells she had of the guys together combined is the smell of lilacs. Even better. So it like takes the three of them together to make that smell. So freaking cute and precious. Braxton has been in the hospital for 10 days and it's time for her to be released. Houston and Lauren are there to pick her up and bring her home, and it's time for her to let her mother have it out about banning them from the hospital. How she's treated Rosalie, her choice to be in this poly relationship, kind of everything. Like, her and her mom just have a go about everything with her life, her sister's life, I mean, it obviously needs to be said. After the epic fight with her mom... Braxton gets into Houston's car and she asks where Rich is. They get back to the house and Braxton is greeted by a surprise welcome home party featuring Bound and record label people, Griff and Mako, and Rich. Turns out Emily's bullet missed him and went into a wall and she's currently in jail. And this doesn't get confirmed, but I have a feeling that M. Anonymous was Emily. Oh, it definitely was her. It definitely was Emily. And I thought that from the first time I saw that handle, I was like, this has to be fucking Emily. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it is. We get another time jump of about two and a half months. The tour has been postponed to allow Brax time to heal. And we realize she's lost her synesthesia. From Emily's assault, right? Yep. And now it's Lauren's birthday. And they're taking a day trip, keeping Braxton blindfolded the entire time. So it's like a, a plane ride and a car ride, and Braxton is just blindfolded for this whole through this whole thing. Now that's trust, right? When they get to their destination, it's time for a little sexy game. Houston removes Braxton's dress, revealing the lilac lingerie, and Lauren informs Brax that Houston and Rich are going to play with her first and get her ready for him. Rich and Houston both begin fingering Braxton and kissing her for a bit. Rich brings Braxton down to the floor with him, and she begins riding him. She's still blindfolded. She hears something pop open, but the guys tell her, it's nothing. Don't worry about it, Don't worry about it. (laughs) Keep keep riding, Rich. Keep riding. Keep riding. I want to (laughs) ride. While she continues to ride. (laughs) Houston gets behind Brax and he begins to finger her ass. Once she starts to relax and get warmed up for butt play, Houston asks if she trusts them. When she says yes, they remove the blindfold and she sees that she's in her hometown church. Oh my, yeah, when that was revealed, I was like, wow, okay, they're making a statement with this, okay. Yeah, and Lauren asks her for the rest of his present. Lauren enters Braxton's ass from behind while she's still on top of Rich. And to distract her from the pain of anal, Houston takes her mouth. So she's got three dicks in her. I'm actually surprised that it took this long to get this scene. Right? But yeah. So the three of them start fucking her as one and work together to replace the memories of the church and her town. Very therapeutic. Very priest-like with two more people. Yeah, right. (laughs) Then we cut to the epilogue, which is four years later. Braxton has married Houston, Rich, and Lauren. Her and Lauren are currently visiting Brax's sister, Rosalie, in college at Berkeley. She's had her baby, and she's named the baby after Braxton. It's Braxton. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. He's, what, like four? Four. Four or five-ish. Four or five, yeah. She's divorced her husband. Pete, see ya. She's been disowned by her parents. Yeah, see ya. Who needs ya? And her parents are keeping 
breaks in. When she's in school. Mm -hmm. Houston and Rich have stayed home to take care of Coda, who is everyone's son. Yep. And the reason they've stayed home to take care of him is because he's currently sick. And so, you know, after the little visit, Braxton and, and, and Lauren go back and we find out that um, Rich had like lilacs planted in front of their house. They're all living in Portland now. Just super, super cute. Yeah, and they're just one big fam. One big happy family. And then we skip to a concert night. Find out that Bound has been freed of the Savant record label. Lauren, Rich, and Houston are at their places on stage, and Braxton enters last, and she is the new frontman of Bound. Which I kind of wonder if Houston wanting her to create that melody and like have her sing that song that he wrote was the starting if point. If he of was that. already thinking about Making transitioning him. back to guitar and letting Braxton be the front. I could see that. Me too. Because Houston, I feel like, does think things out. Very much so. More so probably than the other two. But yes, that is Lilac. That was Lilac. Took us on a journey. It took us ups and downs, highs and lows. I mean, this was... A lot of sex. Yeah, and this was a thick book. It's like a... It's like a 600-something page book. Yeah. Yeah, this book is a thicky. Thick boy with all the thick boys. (laughs) (laughs) But we hope you enjoyed that breakdown of <laughs> Lilac, the re- rock star reverse harem novel by B.B. Reed. Let's get into some loves and hates. All right. So I think I can say both of us, I think this is a mutual love, Braxton. Yes. Just her in general. I really liked her as the lead in this book. Same. She was top tier female main character. Yes. I just liked that, as you know, I, in a romance novel, prefer a stronger female, not like a meek, weak, mousy Mm -hmm. female lead. Sold with Braxton. Yeah. And she's just so fiery. She gives the guys hell. She doesn't back down. I think another thing we both appreciate is the pacing of this book. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. I thought that it was very realistic in all elements, not just the sex or the plot, but kind of both. They were very realistic. Yeah, the relationships, how they developed, like, one-on-one, and then also the group relationship dynamic. Yeah, and then also kind of, you know, they're on this tour for a year, and B.B. Reed does a good job at actually using that whole kind of time space. Plus, you get some more, because, you know, they go on a break after her injury, Mm -hmm. Braxton's injury so like obviously it's even more than just that year of touring but I was glad that that was also incorporated and that we did get some like pretty heavy time jumps like when they were at their worst it wasn't just like a day and then they got back together it was almost a month or months right so I I like that same it was so so nice for it to not happen so quick exactly so I am also just like a fan of rock star romances, and I'm also a fan of a reverse harem. So I liked that this kind of had both. I just felt that it fell a little flat for me in both aspects. But I appreciate, like this is the first rock star reverse harem that I've ever read, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I think this book would actually be a good taste into reverse harems because it doesn't get super intense or overwhelming like some other ones that I've read. Yeah, this one, the reverse harem aspect is definitely a lot tamer than a lot of other reverse harems that I feel like both of us have read. Yeah. But also, it's more of a realistic romance novel where like, you know, I know that you've read like a, a monster reverse harem, which is going to be very just batshit crazy. It's Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's not realistic, and it's not supposed to be realistic. But I appreciate that this book is more realistic, and it actually follows that more reality. Yeah. And I I haven't really read a lot of rock star romances as an adult. I've read, like, some rock star kind of YA books Mm -hmm. when I was younger. But, you know, those never really cross over into the... The sexual aspect? Mm -hmm. Right. So did you, you, like... The rock, like, would you read more rock star romances? I would. Slight disappointment I have um, 
is I kind of want more about the industry. And you don't really get that here. Like, I was really intrigued by how the record label was, like, fucking over the band. And I kind of wanted more with that storyline. Okay. I feel that. Unfortunately, a lot of rock star romances that I've read are kind of very similar to this, where you might kind of get this, like, basic background into the music industry, but you're not actually full-fledged. I would love, like, a spinoff of... I don't know, like a novella or something that like Oni and Xavier. Because like, yeah, there was was, definitely... There was definitely tension of some sort between the two of them. Right. And like, I wanted more with Danielle, their personal assistant. Right. And also like with Oni, I kind of got the impression that, yeah, she works for this kind of shitty record label, but she actually didn't want the band to fail. Like she was kind of... One of those situations where, like, she's good, but she's working for, like, an evil entity. Yeah, and then she winds up leaving Savant, so it's, like, clearly clearly she's not a bad character. So I've wanted more about that stuff. I feel that. I also really loved Lauren and Rich's dynamic. In the reverse harems that I have read, I haven't come across the guys being into each other. It's always like the guys are super straight and they're literally just sharing the girl and there's no intersecting between the guys in this like poly relationship. Mm -hmm. So I actually appreciate that because I also feel like it adds to the realistic aspect and I liked it. I thought that it added a really nice like element and it made sense as to like Rich and Lauren's dynamic early on as to like, you know, surrounding Emily and just kind of their tension because it's clear that Lauren did have a crush on Rich Mm -hmm. for a while. And it wasn't really reciprocated because obviously... You had Emily in the picture. Right. That was one of my loves too. I enjoyed the Lauren-Rich relationship. Yes. I also really loved, I think we stated it during some of the plot stuff, Griffin and Mako, the friendship with Braxton, and I wish we got more of it. I know. We don't really get a whole lot. With them, they're kind of more just supporting characters to give, because, you know, Braxton doesn't have a lot of family, so she needs some kind of support. And so the girls, her roommates, are definitely that. They were just so fun, and I wanted more. And then I liked how they got into a relationship. Yeah. That was cute, too. All right, Alex, let's move on to some hates of the book. Do you want to start? I think you have more than me, so. So my biggest, my biggest kind of hate complaint is no trigger or content warnings in the book or on the author's website. And there's a lot of potentially touchy subject matter in this book. And you're right, there was nothing. And I kind of was like, and I was telling you that I personally don't really need trigger warnings because I feel like I'm just, I've read so much that I don't, I kind of like being surprised in some aspects. But for other people, this book definitely needs... I think some warning or something that's just like, this may be touchy. Please read at your own discretion. There wasn't even that. No, like the only warning you got was about the reverse harem thing and it's for 18 up, but it's like the child bride, child bride. You got like statutory rape. Yeah. You got like dark religious themes. You have violence. You have suicides. You have death. You You have substance abuse stuff. Like all of, there's a lot of very triggering things within this book. So, I think my biggest hate with the actual book is that it took me a long time to get into and start vibing with the male leads. It, I like, yeah, like I could tell that they were hot and like their banter and like the tension that they had with Braxton, I really appreciated because this is also an enemies to lovers. So we knew that we were going to, it wasn't going to be love at first sight type of thing. It was definitely lust at first sight. It was definitely lust at first sight, but like it took me a really long time to like any of the guys. Like, don't get me wrong. I definitely was like, Houston would be my type. Like, (laughs) like I definitely like he's, you know, whatever. But like, other than that, normally I get a little bit more like into the main characters and it, it took me a little bit. And I don't know why. I don't know if it was just the character development just was more slow or if they just came off really, really hard out of the gate. Houston definitely did. It took me a while to get on board with him. Like, I enjoyed the flirty sexual banter between him and Braxton when they'd be arguing. 
but I just I didn't like Houston for the longest time. Yeah, and I think the reason I liked Houston is based off of the descriptions of all three. Like he would definitely be probably more of the type that I would be like attracted attracted to, to out of all of them. But yeah, like personality wise, it took me a while to get on board for like all of them. Yeah, personality wise, I liked Rich and Lauren. And then I started to hate Rich and Lauren. And then you started to like Houston. And then I started to like Houston. So it was like I was on a roller coaster <laughs> with the three guys. Right. But once I once I was able to start liking them, I did like them and I enjoyed them. But it just it took me a long time to get there. I have a petty hate. Okay. And it's with Jericho. Okay. So I hated Jericho, Rich's name being linked to the character description that he had of like the dark hair emo kid thing. And it's totally because of the wrestler Chris Jericho, who I've had associated with that name for years. And they don't look anything alike. They look nothing alike. And Jericho is also, well, Chris Jericho, the wrestler, is also a musician and has a band. Oh, okay. So it's just like when you were reading it, you were picturing him, but you're like, but that's not right. I shouldn't be picturing this yeah, so then of... I would get, like, the character descriptions about, you know, like, his black hair being in his face. And I was like, wait, 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 no, no, that's not what is lining up here. <laughs> I could see that. That is a little petty, but also kind of annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so it probably took me about, like, 40% of the book to actually have Rich's character descriptions associated with the Jericho name. So I was very thankful for the nickname Rich. So one thing that... I don't know if you're going to agree with me on this, but (laughs) I kind of wanted more smut. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. Yes. Don't get me wrong. There is a ton of sexy, smutty scenes, but there aren't a whole lot of actual reverse harem sex scenes, which we get at the very last sex scene is like the one time that all three of them, well, four of them are like participating. And I kind of was just like, It's being marketed as a reverse harem. Give me the group scene. Yeah. So I kind of was just, I was not expecting that element to be lacking. And then also to kind of piggyback off of that, a lot of, there were a lot of end of chapter sex scene teases. Where it was like fade to black and then Mm -hmm. it picked up with another character who wasn't. Or implied that it was about to happen. And then you would immediately jump into like a different character's point of view. Okay. Who's not involved in the sexy time. Right. And it was like, cock tea. But like, also, don't get us wrong. There is a lot of sex scenes in this thing. It's just not what I was expecting for a reverse harem. That's all. And I think that B.B. Reed writes a really good, smutty scene. Which is why I wanted more of them. Instead of teasing me with the fact that it's going to happen, no, you can write write a sex scene. Right. I would like to have another one, please. Give it to us, girl. Please, B.B. Reed, may I have some more? (laughs) Yeah, so that's that's what I meant, so yeah. Kind of a bigger thing I hated with this book, or wish was done differently, is the little sister, child bride, pregnancy storyline. Like, that was a very big bomb to drop on us. But we really didn't get much about it. Yeah, and that storyline just wasn't really expanded or given as much depth as I feel it deserved. I just think that it was a little unnecessary. It kind of like, I feel like it might have just been thrown in there to add like shock factor, but it wasn't really ever really like, like you don't really understand what is going on with this. Yeah, it felt like a plot device for shock to just like illustrate how strict and like rigid and kind of conservative the parents are. And the town is and kind the town of going is. off of her experiences too. Which could have been done in a different way. I just hate the fact that why does she have to be 13? Like 13? Yeah. Like you could have made her 16. Like, and it still would have had that shock factor because she still would have been underage. It still would have been like a statement. But I just feel like she went so big on this. But it just kind of, like, dropped off. Yeah, so then it fell flat, and then, you know, it just felt like it was being used for shock. And also no trigger content warnings for that element. So my last hate that I have for Lilac is I thought that the book was very well-paced and detailed, and I enjoyed it up until the very end, where it was like they kind of 
get their shit together, and then the book just ends. And it was like, I want to see this couple as a functioning couple for more than just a three-page epilogue. I just yeah. felt like it. the pacing and everything was so great, and then it just kind of, boom, like, yeah, end scene, it's like done. the end of the book, it's like, Braxton's finally coming home from the hospital getting a surprise party, and epilogue four years later. And they have, like, a kid, and obviously the relationship is, like, thriving, but it's kind of like, I wish I could see a little bit into that a little, like, a bit more. Because through this whole book, they are not... They're up and down, up and down. Like, it's not. And even the guys' friendships with each other is very up and down. Right. And then it kind of, like, that element, too, I felt like just kind of got wrapped up very quickly. But it was such a big plot point that this band was on the verge of a breakup. And I just feel like at the beginning, you could definitely see the tension between the guys and the chips and the fragments of their relationship. But I felt like them kind of getting over it and apologizing and, like, becoming friends again was kind of quick too. And it was just kind of like a statement. And it was like, oh, they're all, I don't know. I just felt like that needed a little bit more added to it. Agreed. Which kind of leads into my last hate, which is I kind of wish this was a multiple book story. And you know, I'm definitely a fan of a series versus a standalone. And I do think that this book would have been better if it was... And I'm not even saying that she needed to, like, just split this in half and publish it. But, like, she could have added more, like, to each. Kept the same big plot points the same throughout both books. So we really didn't get a whole lot of stories and information about the guys' friendships when they were younger and growing up. Right. So it's like you could have delved more into that. Yeah, and we really don't know how they, like, met. Because they all came from very different backgrounds it was kind of like how did they even cross paths yeah and they're all within a couple years of each other but yeah we just don't really get a whole lot of backstory and then it just finishes a lot quicker than I would like agreed because then I was invested with these people and it was just like a little let down yeah but a couple more things I did enjoy I really liked the um synesthesia stuff like Mm -hmm. with Braxton That's the first time I've ever read a book with that in it. And it added a lot to Braxton's character and just, I don't know, really kind of selling me on some of her emotions and how she sees things. It was was, was nice. Yeah. And I really liked how um, B.B. Reed included bound song lyrics. Yes. I do like that. I appreciate in a rock star romance when the author is able to come up with some lyrics that are added throughout the book. And I thought she did a really good job with them. Yeah. I, I kind of want those to be songs. Yeah. I was like, okay, she should sell these to some rock bands out there. Right? <laughs> be a songwriter, girl. <laughs> so those were our loves and hates for Lilac. Now it's time to go to some more fun stuff that we do on the pod. And Yay! And kick Finally. it off. <laughs> and kick it off with some casting. So for Lilac, we're really just going to be casting the main characters. The bound members, Braxton, Houston, Lauren, and Jericho. So Ashton. Yes. Who's your leading lady? Who's your Braxton? Okay. So I think we all know who the obvious choice is for this casting, but I had already casted her in an episode that we had only done a few weeks ago. So I decided to venture out and I chose the actress, Catherine McNamara. She plays Clary on the Shadowhunters TV series on Freeform. Um, she's like a redhead actress. Um, yeah, so she's that's who I went with. Because I know who you chose, which is also who I wanted to choose, but I was like, I can't. Because I've already chosen her. So, recently. So who is that, Alex? That would be the lovely and talented Miss Bella Thorne. Obviously. I mean, like, I was picturing Bella in this role, like, the whole time. Also, she would not shy away from this content, she'd probably no. thrive. She'd probably like, hell yeah, let's Bell go. Bella Thorne <laughs> is the perfect Braxton. If B.B. Reed didn't base Braxton off of Bella Thorne, I will be shocked. All right, so want to move on to Houston? Yep. Okay. I had trouble casting Houston until I made my decision, and I'm sticking to it. It's funny, because Houston was, besides Braxton, because it was an obvious... Bella. Houston was the first person who I had an idea of who 
I would have casted. And, like, that is Liam Hemsworth. And, I mean, because, like, I don't know. I just think the build, the, like, coloring. And, I like, Liam, I could feel like would be – I could see him being, like, a front man of a band. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. So who is your who is yours here, Houston? So my Houston – we're going to have to go back in time a little bit for my Houston. Perfect. To the early 2000s. Okay. Gabe Saporta, the front man of Cobra Starship. Yes. Okay. All right. We went very different, but I'm like not mad at it. Oh, I would have liked, I like that. Okay. Very different, but equally as intriguing. And why did you choose him? Well, one, he is a front man yep. for a band. Mm-hmm. Or was. And I don't know, just like. His demeanor on stage, he just has, like, he exudes confidence. And I just feel like he could take that and, like, hone it into, like, the the Houston personality okay. and persona. I got that. So want to move on to Jericho next slash Rich. So I do have two for him. Um, I have Andy Biersack, who is the front man of Pierce the Veil. I felt like he... Definitely gave the aesthetic of kind of what I was picturing Rich to be. Because he is kind of that more emo punk. He, you know, he has a lip piercing. He definitely gives. And he's also a musician. So, um, but my other choice, which I'm leaning towards more and more, like the more I look at this picture that I found. And we have to go back in time to like the 80s. (laughs) But a young Jared Leto. I could see as... Freaking rich. You're not wrong. So, yeah, that would, my, that would be my choice. A young Jared Leto. About, like, 30 years ago. <laughs> Before he went super crazy. <laughs> so my choice for Jericho, we can stick to today's times. Because we go too far back then, that's just weird. <laughs> Is Harry Styles. Interesting. Okay. I mean, he does kind of have the... Like, Harry definitely comes off as a little bit more, like, in tune with his emotions. And, like, Rich is very in tune with, like, his emotions. With Jericho having the relationship with Lauren, I feel like Harry has that more fluidity element element to him. Yeah. But, like, Harry also does have that um, aesthetic sometimes Mm -hmm. when he wants. And lastly, pulling up the end of this train is Lauren. So I have two for Lauren. Um... One has to go back in time as well. I'm taking liberties, y'all. I think we're all taking, we're both taking liberties. These are dream castings. These are dream castings. Clearly no executives are coming to us for our actual opinion on it. (laughs) So I would choose a young Paul Walker to be Lauren. He's just the blonde, pretty boy, hot. Like, and I also feel like Paul Walker could emulate that only child. Like, I just feel like he could slay a Lauren. Yeah, he definitely could have. And then my second choice is Luke Hemmings from Five Seconds of Summer. He's their, like, front man. And he's, you know, the blonde, pretty boy, too. A little bit more rugged, but in real life. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I was like, Lauren. Like, yeah. Yeah, not a bad choice. Plus, he plays guitar already. So. And he's a musician. musician, So. There we go. Yeah. So who who is your Lauren? So my Lauren, and this person still looks wonderful today. But I would like to go back in time just a wee bit, if possible. But again, I'm also fine with current day. Right. Ryan Gosling. That's a good one. And Ryan Gosling can play the bass. That's a good one. Yeah, and Ryan Gosling, like, his um, aesthetic is very, I feel like, Lauren. Like, Mm -hmm. Lauren is very put together. Like, I feel like Ryan Gosling is very put together. And, like, you have a picture of him playing bass as one of your, like, inspo pictures. And, like, he's wearing khaki, or, like... A button-up shirt and like nice dress pants, like, and I could kind of see. But Lauren, still has like this cool guy, like. Yeah, like I could see Lauren wearing that, him. just with the thing, like the with like the, the shirt, shirt unbuttoned. unbuttoned all the way versus yeah. only a couple. But like unbuttoned. very much, I can I can get behind that. I think that's great. And I think he would pull off that like you know came from money money upbringing thing only child vibes. Like I think he could just do the Lauren attitude. Yes, just. And those are our castings. I hope that (laughs) you enjoyed them because (laughs) I did. So, Alex, do you want to go right into our song choices? Yes. And we've kind of done it a little bit different. Yeah, we still have, like, our top few picks of songs. But also, since this is a rock star romance, 
who do you think Bound sounds like? To start off, this book also had a playlist associated with it. Mm -hmm. So did you choose a song from that this week? I did not, but I did put all of the songs from the book playlist into ours. Okay. So I did choose just one of the songs that B.B. Reed kind of gave us since you did that last week. And I was like, oh man, I did it. And look, we're reversed. (laughs) Never on the same page, but that's all right. But then also always on the same page. Right, it's so (laughs) weird. So the song I chose from B.B. Reed's playlist was Polyamorous by Breaking Benjamin. And I just think that that just sums up the whole book. I mean, like, this is a, it's a reverse harem. It is. So it is a poly, it's a poly romance. I think my song that kind of sums up the whole book is Addicted by Saving Abel. So good. That is a really good choice and such a good song. Okay, so my next song choice that I chose was Tempt My Trouble by Bishop Briggs. And this is just like emulating the like tension and stuff between Braxton and the boys. Because it's pretty much just being like, tempt me. Like, I want it, but I don't. Mm -hmm. Like, we're nothing but trouble, essentially. And I think that that really sums up their kind of relationship in, like, the beginning of the book. My beginning of the book song. (laughs) Kind of on the same page here. A song for the boys about hating Braxton. Drop the Girl by Hit the Lights. Yep. Yep, that's a good one, too. Yeah, pretty much just being like, drop her. She's no good for you. Like, all she's going to do is cause damage and yep. <laughs> chaos. And what are you doing? <laughs> Love it. So I did choose a song to represent Houston and Lauren. A little bit of Rich, not so much. And that is Control by Puddle of Mud. Because that's their whole thing. Like, especially Houston. He's such a control freak over everything. And, like, that song is kind of being like, I want to control you, but, like, I can't. And, like, Braxton is not controllable. Yeah, you're not wrong. As much as Houston wants her to be. (laughs) Great choice. (laughs) My next song is kind of a representation of, like, Braxton, like, her upbringing and kind of the way she sees herself, like, thinking that she's a nympho and just kind of all of her inner Mm -hmm. demons and struggles. And then getting into the limelight and, like, having people criticize her, which is Sex Metal Barbie, by In This Moment. Oh, okay. Inter- oh, I like that. That's a good choice, too. So, like, my Braxton song that kind of incorporates her, like, sex addiction, if you want to call it that, is Maneater by Nelly Furtado. And that's just, like, such a fun song. It is a fun <laughs> one. <laughs> my last song choice is about, like, the reconciling love between everybody. And it's the song Only Us by Paper White. Ooh. Okay. I like that. I didn't choose a song that represents that aspect. I like that. That's good. My last, or my second to last song is Sorry by Buck Cherry. And this is like, obviously, like, I could see Bound writing this song for Braxton. Being like, sorry, I'm such a, like, asshole, (laughs) like, fuck up. Like, you don't deserve it. But I want you to know that I'm, like, sorry. Oh, that could have been a really cute. Right? Yeah. So, like, I was like, ah, oh, yes. And then my last song is Paper Cuts by MGK. And I think that I chose this song to kind of represent that element of the fact that this record label kind of, like, trapped them in a deal. And, like, that's pretty much what Paper Cuts is about. It's, like, signing a contract and, like, kind of losing who you are because mm-hmm. now the label pretty much owns, like, owns you. So who is your bound sound? Like, what band do you think so I had I had a really hard time with this because I kind of had a few ideas of what they sounded like so like me I chose a few bands I'll just list them off Foo Fighters Rev Theory Three Days Grace Asking Alexandria like somewhere in there it's it's one type of that kind of band and I know they're all kind of a little different Mm -hmm. what about you Who I think Bound sounds like before Braxton get introduced. Once for that too. Before Braxton would be Cartel and Mayday Parade. Oh, okay. And then once Braxton takes over at like with the epilogue and becomes the front man, I'm thinking Hailstorm. Okay, so I had for after she took over, I had Pretty Reckless or Paramore, something like that. And Hailstorm's another one that, like, I could definitely see being them. So I think all of those are really good. I'm here for all of those. Yeah. All right, Alex, we're coming up on the end of, oh, before that, 
And make sure you check out our Spotify playlists. We actually have made like a page for all of our music playlists for all the books and stuff that we do. Yep, our profile on Spotify for the music is Emotions and Potions Pod. So similar to all of our other handles, if you wanted to check out those, all of the episodes up to this point will be, playlists will be on that Spotify account. So go take a listen, see if you agree with us. And they'll be linked in all the things. Yeah. So Alex, we're coming up on the end of the episode, end of Lilac by B.B. Reed. Time to rate and give our letter. Yeah. So what did you rate the spice on this book? I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. A 3.5? Okay. And why is that? I mean, it's definitely spicy. You definitely get good smut scenes. But, like, nothing was too crazy. There was only, like, two scenes that kind of were a little outside the norm, right? if you will, mm-hmm. which is, you know, obviously the DP thing. and then, The last scene where they're all and together. The, and the very last scene. Okay. I gave it a four um, just because I do feel like with a reverse harem, you know, she's, even though she's most of the time only having sex with one of the guys at a time, she's also sleeping with like multiple people. It's not necessarily like there's a lot of public sex. Um, obviously the scenes with the more intense out of the norm scenes. For me, I probably wouldn't rate it this high, but for like thinking of other readers, I would say that this is a pretty intense money book. So I would say that it's like a four out of five, but like 3.54, we're right on the target. Yeah, I mean, right within the same kind of scale. Yeah. So that leads us to our overall ranking. What did you give Lilac? A seven out of 10. I did too. I did too. I think that it was well written. Oh yeah, definitely well written. I think the plots were really good. I think that they had good concepts behind them, but I do feel like it Some of lacked. them just lacked for me. Yeah. And like- they, I was sucked in by a lot of the, like, smaller subplot stuff that I just wanted more of. Right. And it, it, it fell. Exactly. And I felt the same way. And the fact that it did take me a little bit to kind of get into this book, normally I'm hooked out of the gate. I can be absorbed in a story pretty easily. And it, it took me a little bit. And the ending kind of really threw me. Yeah. So, Alex, I'm going to have to go with soft hate letter on this one yeah same it's also going to be a soft hate for me um and I say soft because I will and slash am interested in reading more of B.B. Reed I really liked her writing style and I'd be intrigued oh definitely I want to read more from her and this wasn't a bad book no no by any means but I just feel like I have read some really really great rock star romances and I've read some really really great reverse harems and compared to what I've already read, this was just kind of in the middle, you know? Like, yeah. I would still recommend it, especially, you said it, I think it's a good entry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely not a bad book. It's just, I don't want to ever reread it. Yeah. But I would want to read some of her other stuff. Yeah, I want to read other things from her. I just, I want to pick up Lilac again. Yeah. And it's also, like, it is a longer read. Mm-hmm. Like, it is a long book. So, yeah. So that, those are our love letters. Um, I don't, hate letters. <laughs> I know our hate letters. Sorry, BB. This is nothing towards you. It's a soft hate. It's soft. It's like, you know, we have to choose one or the other. <laughs> that's the, that's the name of this podcast. Love or hate. Yeah. And there's no medium ground. Nope. And not everything can be a love. No. So thank you for listening to another episode of Emotions and Potions. A love slash hate letter to Lilac, which was a soft hate from both of us. Please go and follow us on the gram, TikTok, Emotions and Potions Pod. Follow us on Spotify, Emotions and Potions Pod. Subscribe, share. All the, all the things, <laughs> all the things. Interact with us. Leave yeah, us a let review. Us know. What do you want to hear from us? And if you have any recommendations, send them our way. Until next time, it's been fun. It's been fun. <laughs> See ya. Bye.